Okay, I'll repeat again. Uh, if you want to change your name, the example is in the chat room. And if you, if your camera isn't support to on, so it's okay.
Yuditia Wahyu Perdana. Welcome to the Honorable Leader of Student Council of the Economics and Business Faculty, Brother Jogi Fernando. Welcome to the Honorable Representative of the Organization of Economics and Business Faculty of Riau University. Welcome to the Honorable Chairman of EFEC 2023-2024 period, Mikhail Suryadinata. Welcome to the Honorable to Leader of Student Council of the Economics Steven, and Business Brother Faculty, Jeremy Joy, Brother Jogi Fernando, and Sister Jessica. Welcome to the Honorable to all of the participants who has joined the Economics and Business Faculty of Zoya University. Welcome to the Honorable Chairman of the Indonesia 2023-2024 period, Mikhail Suryadinata. Welcome to the Honorable to all of the participants
students, this NUDC webinar also aims to encourage and spread enthusiasm for students to have the courage to read and voice their notions with confidence in English. We really hope that this webinar will encourage and inspire you to become a great debaters and participating in National University Debating Championship and also any other English debating championship. Lastly, I would like to thank all the committees who have organized this wonderful event today. And once again, the warmest welcome to all of the NUDC participants today. That's all from me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Najla. The next welcoming speech is by Chairman of IFEC, Mikhail Suryadinata. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for the moderator for the chance. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to our God because of his mercy, we can stand here and we can attend our event with healthy. And, and now uh, I will say welcome to our three vice dean, Mr. Rendra Wasnur, SAMEB. And then I will say welcome to our student council, uh, Jogi Fernando as representative. I will say welcome to student governor uh, as a representative. Uh, and then uh, without making this speech so long, I just straight forward. Thank you for all the committee who was already prepared this event very well. Uh, and then for all the webinar press uh, participants, I hope you can take away all the knowledge that the speaker will provide in this webinar. Uh, and I hope uh, this webinar will be going well uh, to the end. Thank you. Uh, me, Mikhail Serenata. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you to Mikhail. The next welcoming speech is by the leader of Student Council, Jogi Fernando. That can be here. Uh, because uh, Brother Jogi Fernando can be here, uh, we will remove to the next uh, welcoming speech. The next welcoming speech is from Student Governor of Economics and Business Faculty, Yuditya Wahyu Perdana. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sebelumnya, izin menyampaikan permintaan maaf karena Kakanda Yuditya Wahyu Perdana selaku Gubernur Mahasiswa tidak bisa membersamai pada acara kali ini. Saya selaku perwakilannya, protokoler, mengucapkan permohonan maaf dari beliau. Selamat siang untuk semuanya. Selamat pagi. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim, kita masih diberi kesempatan untuk acara debat pada kali ini. Sebelumnya saya mengucapkan selamat datang kepada Ayahanda Rendra Wasnuri, SEMIB. Selanjutnya kepada Gubernur juga, ada DPM dan kepada para panitia semuanya. Pada acara argumen debat kali ini, saya mengucapkan dengan adanya acara yang ditajak oleh efek dengan hal tersebut dapat melatih mental, juga keberanian untuk meningkatkan kemampuan yang solutif dan untuk meningkatkan sikap yang kritis. Terima kasih kepada para panitia yang sudah mengadakan acara ini, tentu sangat berguna kepada halayak ramai. Saya mengucapkan akhir kata wabillah Taufik Walidaya, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to the representative. And the last but not least welcoming speech is from our third vice dean of economics and business faculty, Rio University. Please welcome Mr. Rendra Wasnuri, SAMIB. Thank you very much, uh, MC and EBC adult. <laughs> very best uh, speaking for this morning. Uh, Anyone? Maybe if you heard my voice very clear. Hello? Anyone? Uh, I can hear your voice, sir. Okay, thank you very much for the feedback. Yeah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for 
but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has been giving us blessing and mercy that we can attend today in the condition. And then, uh, Honorable, the committee and uh, the student who have attempts in this webinar and UBC, I'm very appreciative. This is the activity that will bring us to the next level in English, actually, so we can practice, as they say, uh, if we are uh, our uh, practice, make it better. So this is uh, the, the time for us to making a practice in English. Uh, I'm very appreciate for the uh, NEDC for the activity that uh, they are you know, making the media for us to practice in English, especially in our faculty. And I'm very sorry I cannot attend the event until finish, which I have a staff class also in the GOBA. So I'm the I hope this activity will uh, give us some uh, motivation to make it our English much better. And then for the committee, once again, <clears throat> I'm very thank you for the activities. I hope in the future we will meet again in the, uh, the offline, uh, not in daring, but better. I think it is the, the final of my uh, speech today in this morning. I hope this uh, you can enjoy the activity and making benefit for all. And I will finish with Fabila with Taufiq Walidaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mr. Rendra. Our next agenda is pray. I invite my friend Sultan Taki to lead us in pray. Time is yours. Tes, tes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Doa ini akan saya pimpin secara Islam Dimohon para hadirin untuk dapat menyesuaikan Nur agama dan keyakinan masing-masing A'udzubillahiminasyaitonirrojim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajmain Allahumma fil muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahyahi minhum wal amwat innaka sami'ul kharimul mujibul da'wat ya hadiyal hajat Allahumma inna nas'aluka salamatan fid dinina wa afiatan fi jasadina wa ziyadatan fil ilmina wa barakatan fir rizqina wa taubatan qabla al maut wa rahmatan 'inda al maut wa maghfiratan ba'da al maut Allahumma hawin alaina fi syakaratil maut wa najata minan nari afwa 'inda al hisab Allahumma ya Allah ya Rahman limpahkanlah kekuatan serta kesehatan kepada para peserta panitia dan semua yang terlibat dalam kegiatan ini Sampai selesainya kegiatan kali ini. Karena hanya engkau lah maha pemberi karunia. Ya Allah, Ya Rahim. Bimbinglah kami dengan taufik dan hidayahmu. Agar kami dapat menjalankan kegiatan ini. Dengan keinginan, kemampuan, dan keikhlasan. Untuk meningkatkan dan membangun integritas pribadi. Ya Allah, Ya Hadi. Kami mengakui segala kenikmatan yang telah engkau anugerahkan. Dan kami juga mengakui segala dosa kami. Maka ampunilah kami. Karena sesungguhnya tidak ada yang dapat memberikan pengampunan dosa kecuali engkau. Ya Allah, Ya Mujibas Sa'ilin. Rabbana atina fid dunia hasana wa fil akhirati hasana tau wa kina azaban nar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Sultan. Once again, I want to remind all the participants 
please take a screenshot of the Zoom meeting for the proof of the attendance list at the end at the end of the webinar. And that is all. That, that is all from. And that is all from me. Now we move to our moderator, who will lead the event. Let us welcome our moderator, Muhammad Nur Fakhri. Okay, thank you for the master of ceremony. Now it's my time to take over this event. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Mamon Bakri, and I'll be your moderator today for this section. Mm, I guess you are excited today because we have two amazing speakers that will join us today and will give us a valuable knowledge and talk us about more about NDBC. But before that, I want to remind you that don't forget in the end, in the end of this event, there will be a main there will be a main event that is piano section and games. The three lucky person to finish the game will get a prize from us. So don't forget to stay focused and listen to the material that will be given from our speaker today. Okay. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker today. She is a core of North Sumatra University Open 2022, GF Judge of AEO 2021 and FT 2021, NUDC 2022, champion of GDF Open 2021, ESLGF, and top five is the best speaker of Mini Melbourne 2016 and has been loved with it ever since. It has helped her to improve her communication skill, confidence, and be critical. She studied in USU and currently works as sales and marketing in SAS company. And the work experience that our speaker has been is as a sales executive, marketing team leader, freelance CEO, content writer, and as sales and marketing officer. Certificate that speaker achieved as the breaking adjudicators in National University Debating Championship from 2020-2021, ESL Grand Finalist of Mini Melbourne Australia 2020 until present and Breaking Judge of GLC Debate Open India 2021 until present. The organization that this speaker joined is USU Society for Debating since 2016 to 2020, and Himatif USU 2017 until 2018. She also spent her free time to teaching class or coaching when she has time to. Okay, wow, from the CP we know that our speaker is a really, really talented and amazing person. Okay, without further ado, let me call our person, Ka Jessica. Okay, well, Hi, everyone. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Jessica. Am I audible? Yeah, you said double. You are double. Okay, let me open my camera first. All right. Okay, before All uh, right. Uh, before we think of Jessica, I want to uh, remind you that we, we have a Q and a game session at the end, so please listen to the material that Kat Jessica will be giving. Okay, hello Kat Jessica. Hi, how are you guys? Yeah, how are you today? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe uh. Uh, I will give time for you to give the material for Kadiska time is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, can you guys please help to share the screen? Okay. Wait. Okay. okay, so uh, before we start, I'd like to just say thank you for the committee for um, inviting me to this event. And um, I try to accommodate the lesson to be as uh, basic as possible as well. And uh, because I understand that there might be people here that is new with PP debating with um, NUDC particularly. So I'm going to just um, start very slow in case that you have any question, um, you can try to ask it. I think you can just drop it in the chat box or maybe you can direct that to the committee. 
activity and later on uh, we can discuss that in Q&A session. So for this um, slide, uh, this is reflected from NUDC slides um, year to year. Um, yeah, this um, the, the full credit for the ACORN um, that helped to create this um, debate slide uh, from different tourney. And I hope that um, you guys can check out all those um, motion from those tourney as well, because like I think that it's going to be relevant uh, next. Okay, so the agenda for today is that uh, if I'm speaking too fast um, and you cannot catch that, uh, just like let me know. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about NUDC briefly. I would like to introduce it for a bit. And then we're going to talk about BP debate structure. The dawn in BP, uh, we're going to talk about speaker roles and motion types. Well, I think that the second session of today's uh, webinar will be discussing about most um, arguments and how you could be able to structure and create an effective arguments. So let's talk about NUDC next. So what is NUDC, right? So NUDC is a National University Debating Championship. Um, it's a national competition that is officially held by the government, by Indonesian government. So the um, event itself is always done each year. Um, we always try to make sure that there is an improvement within the system. That is to say, we try to accommodate with pandemic before. And I think that this year is a bit different as well because we are starting with new normals and um, yeah, and UDC is basically a very prestige competition that is held um, by the government of Indonesia. Next. Now, what makes it different with other national competition? I bet that everybody would like to wonder about this, right? If it's a national competition, why can't I just like join maybe NOFET or why can't I just join USU Open, for example, which is also a national competition? Um, one of the main difference is that NUDC, not just because NUDC is held by government, but because NUDC is usually always uh, being uh, participate on by all the university in Indonesia. So you can imagine all the university in Indonesia participating and competing to be able to get a slot inside of NUDC in regional selection. And then in national selection, you're going to always competing with a university that uh, that you might never encounter. The experience is different because it's everybody. Everybody want the slot. Everybody want to be a champion. Everybody want to get um, to be in grand final of NUDC. So it's a very competitive um, competition as well. Not to say that other national competition is not competitive, but the difference would be that in other national competition, you might have this barrier of entry where all uh, participant might be um, somehow used to with debate. They have debate experiences. That's why they know the competition. But with NUDC, it's everybody, right? Even though it's competitive, but even though you don't have experience in debating, you still have a chance because it is open for everybody. It's not just um, limited to, let's say, a debate club to participate in it. So everybody who is not a part of the debate club, a lot of the time can still participate in selection, uh, uni a university base, and can still be a delegate to a, the regional selection and even to the national. So that's one of the main differences between the prestige of NUDC. Next. Now, who should join in UDC then? Um, if you are a student in university wanting to get a re like an experience competing in a competition and you would like to get the prestigious um, of it, being able to um, get certificate, being able to get um, a lifetime of friends, being able to learn a lot of different new skills, then you should participate in NUDC. It's not just limited to people who already like debating for two or three years or like limited to people who know debate. Um, everybody should be able to aim to want to be an NUDC um, delegate because you don't just get the benefit of like competing but you also get a benefit from the training because like during the training time you're going to learn so many different skills that will be helpful for you um, in your day-to-day -day life in your college life or even going to be helpful for you in your work life um, I think that I first hand um, experienced this I'll just like put the experience part in the beginning and then we can move on to debate later uh, I learned debate uh, starting for, from college actually I never debated in high school and I was a shy person I will never be able to speak like this if it's not because of debate um, so I don't like speaking in public I don't have any I 
no English. I have English skill, but I don't think that my English skill would be able to accommodate me to speak freely like this, right? There's a lot of barrier of my English because it's passive English. I, I'm good at English um, in academic sense. I can get good score in college, but doesn't mean that I can speak English well. And that's what uh, participating in debate competition helped me with. It helped me not just to be able to structure my thoughts, but it also helped me with my communication skills because it helped me to convey all of this knowledge that I learned um, in terms of communication, in terms of English, in terms of critical thinking, and try to put that and pour that into words by words, into sentence by sentence. So it allowed me to be able to speak like this um, in front of you, everybody, um, right now. And it helped me to be able to get through my interview. I know that it sounds cliche, like how could debate help you during interview because like you're argumentative and stuff. But the communication skill really do build the confidence on me. So during my time into looking for a job or like during my time into coaching or teaching in general, it helped me to build up confidence and not just because of confidence, oh, now I can speak, but because debate helped me to get Get to know how to be able to learn. It helped me with building the skills needed to do research. It helped me to build the skills uh, for me to be able to questions because questioning is a very important skills that I think being underestimated on daily basis. Um, if you question stuff, a lot of people might think that you're nosy or like, um, why are you questioning everything? But questioning things is the key point of a critical thinking. If you never question something, then you will never be able to uh, find an answer. So by questioning, you start to be able to build a more effective system of thinking, research, and yeah, just generally becoming a more rich individual right so you do a lot of things you do you read a lot as well because of it so that's um, why you should join in UDC and everybody should be able to aim to join it even though that you may or may not get the slot but trying to join it, it itself would also give you the benefit of the skills next Right, so let's go a bit technical. What is the debate system used in NUDC then? And we're going to go um, discussing about that. So there are a lot of debate system access um, in our world, right? So we have Asian parliamentary, uh, which is more popular among high school. We also have um, WUSDC style, which is also popular among high school. High school. If you debate in high school, you might be uh, familiar with that type of system. Uh, we also have Austro. Um, which is, um, I think, quite rare, but I think we have a competition for that. If you know IFAT, IFAT use Austral system. And uh, we also have British Parliamentary System, or more known as BP. And NUDC use BP system. And the differences of why a uh, BP system is um, somehow different than the other um, type of debating, one of the most particular differences would be about the amount of speaker and the amount of team debating on the uh, on one round. Um, next, we can go forward to it, how the system looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Right. Um, so a bit on what different BP system with other system. So in BP system, you only speak for seven minutes. Um, usually some competition creates seven minute, 20 seconds rule. But in NUDC, you're going to use seven minute uh, mark. So that is the time that you have to do your speech per speaker. And you are allowed uh, POI between one minute to six minutes. So uh, POI is not really common in Austral because Austral do not allow POI. It only exists on BP and also Asian. Um, impromptu motion, again, one of the differences that in British parliamentary, you are not um, given the topic yet during the pre-competition. So you know what you're debating on when you go to the competition, you see the motion on that uh, marks each round, it will be announced by the team of uh, ACOR, right? The main, uh, the, the head of judges. And um, one of main differences between um, NUDCS BP is also it's a battle of logical skills, not English skill, nor eloquence. So I do mention that you get better at English, but it doesn't mean that English is everything in debate, especially in parliament 
parliamentary system, right? Um, if you have other debating experience outside of parliamentary, maybe you debate um, in law debate, or let's say that you debate in, um, let's say, KTI, or like a lot of different styles, they might prioritize database, or like they might prioritize research base, but in a parliamentary system, especially NUDC, it's a battle about your logic. So it's more about how you could be able to convince everybody that your logic, your case, uh, make more sense in the debate and therefore should win in the debate. It's the most important point. And last but not least, the preparation time is 15 minutes and you cannot have external help. So you cannot discuss with your coach, you cannot discuss with your friends who's not debating. Your only friend to talk about in the preparation time is your teammate, right? So printed materials are allowed, but um, it's you're not allowed to do Googling and we are very, very strict during the whole thing um when we judge for instance so these are one of the main difference between the um debating system parliamentary system and what we use in nudc so next All right so also one of the difference is that in british parliamentary you will have four teams debating in one chamber you have what we call as opening government opening opposition closing government and closing opposition and unlike ap or asian parliamentary there there are only two people inside of one team so there are two people in opening government two people in opening opposition and likewise in cg and also co right so the question is that if you were both government, are you debating as the same side or are you debating as the same team? Like can closing and opening discuss together? The answer is no. So even if you both are government, doesn't mean that you were allowed to talk to each other, right? Because you're still competing to win. So just think of it as a you are on the same side, you're um, supporting the motion, but you're supporting it in your own way with your own reasons. And you are still going to try to say why your reason is better than your opening and why your reason is also better than the opposition. So you're still an individual team and your only friends in chamber is basically your teammate, right? So that you cannot discuss with your opening or cannot discuss with your posting, but this is how the um, debate structure looks like. So we start the debate with prime minister opening the case, go to leader opposition, prime minister, and um, go on until opposition whip as the last speaker in British parliamentary debate. Um, next. Oh, next, I think this is um, kind of repeating. Right. So let's talk about the logical burden. So we talk about logic as the most important thing. So basically, when you debate um, in BP debate, uh, before we go on into individual role, one of the things that you need to always remember is that everybody have a burden to prove, right? Burden of proof is something that you come in the debate to prove on. That's the point of the whole debate, right? You are trying to prove something. So when you're given a motion or a topic, you would be given these three uh, basis of burden versus the logical burden. You need to be able to tell us why is it logically true that the case is the way that you say it. So in sample of, let's say a very simple motion of let's just talk, take a look at this house would ban homework. You need to be able to have a burden to, and you want to say that we want to ban homework because um, it add number of stress to students and it impacted toward their um, effectivity in studying, right? So that's your argumentation. You are given the burden to prove logically why is it that banning homework or like um, somehow homework can cause that stress and therefore banning it will also improve the situation. So that's the logical burden that you are going to be given on the moment that you say something. So debate is a very accountable platform. Anything you say in a chamber, would have to be proof. So even just a sentence when you say that, uh, well, students distress, that's something you need to prove, right? You cannot just like throw that in a debate and then forget about it. You have to always prove, when you say that students are stressed, then you need to prove why they are stressed, 
right? When you say that homework is bad for students, then you need to prove why is it bad? What is your basis of saying that it's bad, right? So that's the logical, um, the logical burden that you have. But besides logical burden, there is also motion-based burden. So it's also important to note that in a certain motion, there is an expectation on what the team or, or what the site should be able to prove. So even though that you are free into deciding what your argumentation would look like, but it's also important to make sure that it is relevant. Uh, I feel like one of the one of the things that a lot of new debater forgot, uh, which is fine actually, you can experiment and try to think of different argumentation because like you're new, but I think that a lot of the time uh, we forgot to think of whether that the argumentation is relevant to the motion, right? So you prove the logical burden, but just because prove, you prove that it is logically true doesn't mean that it is true um, in terms of relevancy. So you could say and speak about a very fairly logical thing in a debate, but it might still not be relevant to what, what the motion want you to do. So it's important to also note and consider whether that your argumentation or whether your case are somehow relevant and uh, fulfill the base uh, burden that the motion want you to do. So we're going to go to this later on. So just, just like a brief to what, what um, the motion-based burden look like. And last but not least is comparison and also framing. Um, it's very important to not debate on isolation. What I mean by isolation, Isolation is that even you are OG opening government, you cannot just debate on opening government case. You have to also consider your opposition side case, right? So this is when it is important to make comparative. And the same way that as a closing debate, you cannot just forget about opening debate entirely. You need to also make an active comparison to why your team should win or why your team uh, proved the best burden of motion and logical burden in the debate. So you always go back to that. The comparison is basically proving why logical you are the best team and why logically uh, why in terms of relevancy you are also the best team so to put it like simply that's how you could be able to make a comparison or framing um, in any bench right in any team um, next Right, so not on the burden. Uh, this is like to show you what I mean before. So for example, in the motion stated, this house believed that new democracies should have law restricting freedom of speech, right? Now, government team would have a burden to explain why the law restricting freedom of speech are crucial for new democracy to have, right? Again, you need to also explain what is new democracy, what make this new democracy different than the previous democracy we have or you need to also mention to why freedom of speech should not be entirely free in new democracy if we want to talk about this logically you need to prove why freedom of speech can be harmful for democracy to some certain extent therefore we need the law restricting it right so that's like a, an example of logical burden because you will say that freedom of speech can harm democracy so you need to prove why the freedom of speech would cause that but for the motion based then you need to be able to talk about a very basic thing why the law should even exist right what is new democracy that is what the motion want you to talk about then you need to explain why then is this, it is necessary to have the law in this situation. So those are like the kind of description that motion-based um, burden would like you to do, right? Basically to describe what the motion want, um, what variable access in the motion. That is what is implied. Now, what is not obvious is in the type of motion because different type of motion will pose different type of burden. So when you are speaking about this house, believe that just a sample, then you need to prove usually a harms of something you cannot just say that something is true you need to prove why is it harmful why is it um somehow good or bad but because it's a principle type of uh, motion in contrary to that in this house would something that is not entirely implied is that you need to also prove why it will works right those are like a unique type of burden that the different motion would have um debate like um it, depending on like what you are asked to do based on the motion so that's like some samples of motion based um burden next 
um, self-imposed, right? So that's what the motion wanted for you to do. And this one is the self-imposed. This is basically the logic in it. So it's the same thing. Whatever that you are saying in a debate, you need to be able to prove that because you put it on yourself, right? You say that you will prove something, then you have to prove that to the debate or else that it will impact the overall performance of your speech because then the judge will think like whether that you promise to prove A and then you don't prove A then the judge will evaluate it based on that like you never prove a while the other team prove it for you that a doesn't make sense on your case for example so that is like uh what most of the time happened in the same way like in the sample sample of motion previously um in this case let's say that you opposition say restriction of freedom of speech may result in a civil war right look out how this statement can be quite um counterintuitive like how so that um like let's say um, restricting freedom of speech can result in civil war so if you don't prove it it make it hard for people to believe then therefore to make people to believe you have to prove that to the debate right so all burden is to show the process of a civil war happening um specifically caused by the existence of law that restrict freedom of speech right so that's something that you can talk about in example to answering to this you can try to mention about the limitation of rights to be able to defend yourself or the limitation of rights uh, between each different community you can say that restricting freedom of speech might impact community differently and therefore it create an unfair situation between community and in terms of expressing themselves so that's like one way of proving this or like explaining to why then people might have attention and therefore you might um, have like a situation where uh, they start to be aggressive to one another between the community you can talk about cases like that for example but the point is to try to prove what you mean when you mention something in a debate next right so what you shouldn't do in a debate right basically when you are debating um you should never argue on irrelevant materials those three things is basically the guidance to do always argue something relevant to the motion therefore you shouldn't argue on irrelevant materials um second of all is to not elaborate ideas or claim because when you just assert something when you just mention that we're going to create a um, civil war if we restrict freedom of speech you are not giving the chance for everybody to understand why is that true so you always have to elaborate right being unresponsive is also something that is no no in a debate uh being unres unresponsive in here means to not engage or to not respond to your opponent case you should always respond to what the other um side of the house is saying even though that you mean you might think like oh my opposition do not bring a relevant case then how should i respond to that or like my opposition are not being elaborative enough how should i respond to that in that case you need to be able to think about um the point being of what you need to clarify let's say or what you need to be able to um prove that they don't answer so think um on a way to respond to them but never not respond no matter like how great their case is or let's say that how different their case than you is as well right so responding is important and also not making comparative or framing your team's identity is not okay as well so this is something that you need to always remember and to not take poi poi become very progressively mandatory nowadays so you need to at least give one or take one so that is to just show that you are engaging especially a cross bench between opening and closing so as a closing it's very suggested for you to take a poi from your opening and in the same way the opening should do that as well because it proves and show the engagement um between the team next Right, let's go to the structure, right? Which is what we are here for. So let's go with the structure of opening um, team and go on to the closing team. Let's start with the opening first. What is the burdens of opening debate, right? So the opening should always start with the most important issues in the debate. 
a lot of the time, the most important issues in the debate is something that is the most obvious. So I'm going to be using this motion a lot throughout our explanation. Um, the example of the motion, let's say, the South believe that feminists should focus on liberal um, value in developing country, right? Let's say that's a motion. Feminists should focus on liberal value when they are trying to promote their, uh, their campaign in developing country. The most obvious thing that opening need to think about is that why should feminists focus on liberal value? That argumentation can become the most important because that is the most obvious thing that the debate or the motion should talk about. And opening should always start with that. Start with the obvious, right? What the motion actually want you to do. And I think that there are a lot of tendency with me when I just start debate before to want to be different. It's like those kind of tendency. I want to make a different case. I don't want to pick on the obvious. But a lot of the time that can cause you harms as your team performance because you might think too far fetch and you might not think of an idea that is, let's say, the most relevant. And at the end of the day, your closing take that and your closing get a higher rank because uh, they are more relevant than your case, for example. So if you are opening, try to think about what is the most important thing. And usually those important thing is in the motion. It's very obvious in the motion and you can start there as an opening team. And refrain from emphasizing dictionary definition. So you should define uh, what the motion want, but do not just like use according to Wikipedia, feminist is what? Or like according to a standard, uh, According to this article, feminist is what? Take on your own definition of what feminist is. And the way that I like to define things is usually to take on objective truth, right? So it's it might not be directly like how Wikipedia define it, but it is objectively what people believe in. We all believe that, um, at least in an objective manner, okay, I'm not saying everyone, but majority of people will think of feminists as a movement that fight for women's rights. Right. So that would be the standard definition of what feminist is. And that is objectively true as well. So you could be able to talk about something more specific. You can say that feminist is a movement that focuses on, um, let's say, that focuses on liberation to all gender, something that is progressively um, moving forward now instead of just focusing of, on women. But um, you might have to prove more why then focusing on all gender is somehow relevant to the concept of feminist now. So you could be able to just briefly say that nowadays in status quo, we can take a look at feminists putting more care toward all gender and not just women, identifying to why men's rights would also impact that women's rights, for instance, and why men is also affected by patriarchy. So just like giving all those little crumbs will help you to show that you understand what you are talking about and it proves your definition as true. So refrain yourself from just saying dictionary definitions and in opening government, and actually this is not just OG, this is everybody in the debate, and opening government. Uh, models is also important, right? Executing a policy. Now, this is not mandatory because not every motion would require you to have a model and not every um, motion would want you to have a policy, but it's important to opening government to always be cautious when you are asked to do so. So you have to always provide this, but alternative to model in a, let's say in a debate that is not this house would, it is always important for OG to describe how the status quo or how the world setup look like, right? So that is an alternative to model. So you might not executing to how policy work, but you still are somehow um, needing to explain to how the concept works. So in the world where you want to say that this house believe that fam feminists should impose more liberal value in developing country, then you need to be able to prove how the current feminists look like right, in developing country. That is not a model, but that is a world setup. You need to set up how the status quo look like. Now, opposition, on the other hand, you need to choose your stance. Um, you either can stick to the status quo by saying that the status quo is fine, there is no issue with it, or you can say that status quo is okay, but we understand that there are certain modifications need to be made, but doesn't mean we need to abandon status quo or a completely alternate policy. Now, the problem with the last one is that this is risky because you 
you need to make sure that you're not proposing the same thing as opening government. Um, a lot of the time when you are proposing something different as opening opposition, you need to make sure that it is different than what o o o opening government is saying. And also, uh, make sure that you don't always just do this just because. Because not in every motion, um, you need to do this. It doesn't work in every motion. Because in some motion, actually sticking to the status quo is the best thing. And proposing to what a different type of burden is hard because you have additional burden to prove as opposition. Because um, you are expected to say also why the status quo doesn't work and why you hate the case of opening government. Now, in a general sense, when you're defending status quo, you only need to engage on why opening case doesn't work, right? Why OG case doesn't work. But because you want to create a different alternative policy, then you need to explain why status quo doesn't work, why OG policy doesn't work, and why your policy is the best, which is like an additional extra step. And you don't want to just like spend time into um somehow, you know, um, structuring a whole entire policy to have your closing defending actually status quo works. And that would just be in contrast, make you look bad as an opening opposition. Because when you say, oh, status quo doesn't work, and then turns out there are teams that prove status quo works, then it make you look entirely lacking as well. Like, why are you putting that extra step? Although in some different cases, you are um, you sometimes need to put this, but this is not something you have to do all the time, putting extra policy as opposition. Next. Now, call closing, right? So we talk about opening. So what is the burden of closing team? Um, closing always have to have extension. Now, what is extension? Um, a lot of people thought that, uh, well, closing need to be different, right? We need to pick on something entirely new to the debate. But entirely new is um, not necessarily mean a different complete team than your opening. So your stance might be the same. Let's say that in the um, feminists should impose liberal value before. You still agree that feminists should impose a liberal value, but the difference is the way that you prove it. You might have different uh, framing to it. You might have different logic, different conclusion, different example, different analysis of factor or responses. And that's what we call as extension. Extension is basically anything different that prove you as being better than your opening. Think of it as that, right? So anything that can be used into proving that you are better than your opening is extension. Even though that's not a new argument. Let's say that your extension is entirely respond. You have respond to your opposition and you believe that that response is most important. For you, opening is lacking in responding to OO. So even though the case is great, they are not winning that OO. So as closing government, you think like, oh, in order for me to win against opening government, I need to prove opening opposition as wrong first, and that's your extension. Or similarly, let's say that your opening government do great in responding, you can make an extension based on argumentation because like opening government did great into proving why OO is bad, but they never proved their own burden. So we're going to prove the burden for them, right? So you could be able to take on that discourse into um, proving why you are better. So there are a lot of different way into making extension and just make sure that in proving this extension it, it's not just saying that we are different and we are new you need to also prove why we are more important and that's basically one of the most important thing as a closing um, team um, should do right the next thing that closing should do is to summarize the debate in favor of your team now this is one of the most fun thing as being a closing because you get to listen to everybody, especially as a whip, right? You get to listen to everybody. And because of that, you have the chance to create a bias adjudication. And bias adjudication in here is to basically to evaluate what have happened in the debate and why is that not strategic and why your team is the most strategic. Basically, again, you do a lot of proving in terms of why your team is the best, right? So summarizing the debate is not to just conclude. You don't just like, okay, so the conclusion opening talk about one, two, three, um, Closing opposition talk about one, two, three, not just like that. But you need to say opening talk about one, two, three, and why is that not enough? 
opening up position also talk about one to three and that is also not enough so that's the kind of summarizing that is um, expected when you are becoming a closing team basically and you might also fill the gap in opening again but don't be repetitive uh, how, how do you know if you're repetitive is when there is no new conclusion, there is no new theme at all, there is no new argumentation, and a lot of the time your argument is different wording but mean the same thing. So if you feel like your case like strangely feel familiar with your opening and you cannot really tell what's the different conclusion, then you might be repeating yourself. So try to be able to do a lot of practice into evaluating. Do I sound the same? Sound the same doesn't mean the same words. Sometimes the words is different because, uh, you know, people's is different. Your English is different. But sometimes the conclusion is the same and the process is also the same. So if you think that the process is the same, the conclusion is the same, you might be derivative or repetitive in that debate, right? So refrain yourself from doing that. Next. Right, so let's get to be more specific to the structure of prime minister and leader opposition and moving forward to the rest of the speaking uh, position. <coughs> so stance, right? Um, First opening need to always bring up what the theme or what the case of their um, team is. So you need to always talk about what is the issue, right? What is the cause of the motion? You need to explain the roots of the problem, the background, the model, all those step by step. Um, the question is, as second speaker, can I do this? Can I be the one who bring the model, right? A lot of the time, some people bring the model in second speaker. Or like, can I um, identify the problem in second speaker? Uh, the idea is not strategic. Again, you will not definitely get fourth because there is no definitive fourth in debate. But the thing is that when you bring all of this in second speaker, the, the, the basic argumentation would be very, very weak because it should come from the first, right? The expectation is the case would progress, right? In second speaker, you might want to talk about impact already. But when you just start doing all of this in the second speaker, then it got the debate to be um, a bit fragile for your case. And it's a bit late in that sense. Or even though that it's not fragile, it make your first speaker case confusing. So what is the problem then? It's like your first speaker is talking about argumentation, argumentation, but then there is no clear reason why the argument should be brought up in the debate. And that's why foundation is important. Foundation is like the core point of your speeches. If you don't have foundation, if you don't have reasons to why we are debating this motion, then it would be very confusing. And a lot of the time, team can lose just because that they don't make sense in the debate. Not making sense doesn't mean they're not logical. It just means that we don't understand why they are bringing that case at all, right? So that's something that you need to be worrying about. So this is what the first speaker need to essentially bring. You need to bring on the stance and argumentation. The argumentation can be anything that you think relevant for the motion, but the most important thing is to create that foundation in the first speaker. Next. Next is um, second opening, the deputies. Uh, so again, if a speaker have do uh, the foundation, they have explained and established the foundation, then what deputy do is basically to provide a key direct responses to opening opposition team. So you need to be able to make sure that you are engaging because again, prime minister might not be able to engage. So let's say as the PM, it's very important that you make engagement. And also you need to make sure that there is um, additional proofing a point that you're doing it doesn't mean that you always have to bring a new argument it just means that you need to be able to let's say cover up to what what your first speaker is lacking right so let's say that you are prime minister your case has been engaged and rebutted by the lo then deputy prime minister will have a burden to defend it back right you don't want your case to be like wide open responded so you need to also respond on the response of your opponent sometimes it it also like that so it's not just the argument that you need to respond but what they are saying on your case is also responsible so you can respond to why their um, rebuttal are not true where their rebuttal is not correct or like not important so that's something that you can um, can do in this um, type of a speech um, I feel I always say that Deputy Prime Minister and Deputy Leader Opposition is a very flexible uh, position because whatever you're doing in the debate is only 
only going to be determined on what is happening in the debate. Unlike PM or LO that has a set of structure of establishing foundation, second speaker know their case when the debate starts because different starting point of the debate might result into different burden for the second speaker, right? So let's say that in second um, speaker case, if you are facing a very strong opponent, then the strategic things to do is to be a very responsive uh, um speaker but let's say that you are facing a case where your first speaker didn't manage to answer the burden that they need to do then you need to be a very defensive type of speaker let's say so it's a very different strategy depending on what is happening in the debate on your the first speaker side so being a second speaker you need to be flexible you need to be accommodating to what, what's going on in the debate and then fit yourself into that situation and like phrase um your structure your strategic differently um in order to be able to feel fulfill the burden that's second speaker next now first closing uh it's similar with the first opening foundation is important but because we would expect the first opening to establish that already the first closing would have to highlight the unique specific contribution so this is not just a whip job okay this is not a second speaker in closing job this is member job so government member and opposition member need to already highlight and explain to why their contribution is different in early on of their speeches this to be able to give us an overview what you're trying to do as well right so framing highlight and explain and of course responding now who should you respond more? Is it closing or is it opening? Let's say that you are closing government and you have both OO and CO to respond to. Who should you respond? You should always respond to what everyone, but you it's not about the team that you need to be focusing on. It's about the case. Who have the most strategic case and what is the most strategic case? So in a case that um, your OO is stronger, then you might want to spend more time on OO, but doesn't mean you ignore closing opposition. Okay, so in a sense of picking who should you strategically respond more, you need to also think about the other team and what is the most strategic thing to respond from here case. So rather than ignoring CO, you need to evaluate on what CO most strategic case and engage on that, even though that you don't like engage on everything on CO and spend more on OO, but you still make a response. And I kind of see it a lot in a debate uh, during like competition where certain closing team focusing heavily on opening and ignore their other closing or vice versa they focus so much on their closing um opponent and it totally ignore the opening and that is not okay because like if you completely ignore one thing that would become a comparative because the judge would also compare compare you against them um we talk about repetitiveness in case, but a lot of the time we also forget that response can be repetitive. So you might not want to repeat what your opposition, um, opening opposition or opening government respond as. So you need to take on a more strategic case toward how you should respond to your opponent. So you need to understand what respond that opening did that is not strategic or not effective enough and as closing you can respond on that that would give you a much better point of engagement rather than repeating to what what has been responded and if eventually responding it very similarly with what your opening did as well okay so that's on closing next Right, so last speaker in the debate, right? The closing uh, whips. So what whips do? Whips should be a judge, like um, I have mentioned before. But what it means is to summarize and strengthen the team case. Um, remember that a whip should never bring a new case. You cannot bring an entirely new case um, in the debate because that wouldn't be credited. You will not get for it, but it will, it will just not be encountered by the judge. So what you should do instead is that you should heavily do a lot of comparison. So you need to do a lot of comparison on your case to what everybody in the debate and proving to why is it better than everyone. So proving something as better is different than bringing new case, right? So bringing new case in here look like into your uh, first speaker saying that the reason why feminists should impose a liberal 
value toward um, toward developing countries is because that uh, we need a more aggressive approach and extreme proximity to what feminist is doing to be able to create an impact. So that's your argumentation. And then as a whip, then you want to say that um, I want to talk about how then feminists could be able to have a better, let's say you want to talk about how feminists could be able to have a better active number of followers in developing country. It might be completely different, especially if your uh, first speaker never talk about that. That is completely new. But framing would look like into saying that, oh, um, opposition talk about how the reputation of feminists are not that good in developing country. Therefore, we shouldn't be that liberal. That's their argumentation. And then what you're saying is that you try to prove that it's wrong. And then you try to relate that, that back to what, what your first speaker is saying to say that uh, the point being is that making an impact is important because we need to change the overall perception of feminists and we need to make sure that feminists is visible, right? What you are aiming for is visibility and that is correlate to what, what, what your first speaker is saying, which is to say that how you could be able to create more controversy. So that is what we call as extension, right? It's not completely new, but it is a different type of take of what your first speaker is saying and depending more to why is it important and what is the impact of that, right? So and actively making comparative why visibility is more important rather than maintaining like let's say good relationship with majority in developing country right so that's a different thing now that's an argumentation that can be provided by whip but you should never bring a completely new case and you should always manifest the same conclusion the conclusion is that we want to create more impact Okay, so that's what you could do in a whip. Um, whip is tricky, I understand. It might be confusing, so I would definitely um, expect a lot of questions, especially on speaker role. So uh, it takes a lot of practice. All role, actually, it's not just whip. Prime Minister, every, every, every role will take you a lot of practice to do. Um, the point is to be able to conceptualize what speaker you want to be when you are like let's say competing in a competition and then focus on that right focus on upgrading your skills on that so let's say that you practice on a whip then you need to do a lot of sparring or even though you don't have sparring partner you don't have other team to debate with you can create let's say um, a way for you to create a whip speech by watching video and creating your whip version of speech for that video for example i do this a lot because sometimes when i practice i don't have friends to practice with. So I watch a debate video and then I would make a whip speaker um, case based on that video or I will make a prime minister case based on that or I will watch the video and make rebuttal for the speaker inside of the video. That would essentially help you when you don't have friends to debate with or even though it's not about that, it helps you to understand other um, debate club structure by actively um, analyzing what they are doing as well in that debate video. So debate video from other competition is also important when you want to improve this um, basic skill of each speaker. Okay, next. Right, so POI. Um, POI is often forgotten in a lot of competition. What I mean forgotten is that a lot of speakers do not make POI and do not receive POI, which is unfortunate because POI is a way for you to be engaging outside of your speech because you only have seven minutes and you might have different questions, a lot of questions to your opponent. And the way that you could do that is through POI. Uh, POI is only 15 seconds. And please make sure that when you do POI, you're not like being badgered about it. You don't just like completely unmuting yourself and say POI, POI, POI. Please be patient about it. However, how should you take um, and how should you give POI, right? So a strategic POI should be relevant to what the speaker is saying, but in a way that your POI can be formed into a question, can be formed into a statement, can be formed into a bias take to what, what they are saying, but whatever it is, don't just POI, um, don't just POI something that is irrelevant. That is to say that they are not saying point A, but you POI point A. Unless that point A is a very important thing in the motion, okay? Let's say that your opponent is not being relevant, then you can point that out. You can say that, uh, you can try to POI and ask them to what is their perspective toward this burden of the motion, 
right? So you can ask that. You can ask anything. Just be strategic about it. So you can think about what is the the thing that um, is missing from your speech that you think can be a key point that um, help you enter the debate better. So POI can be also helpful when you uh, haven't speak yet in the debate and you want to enter the debate by uh, making a lot of questions firsthand to what the other speaker, right? You can also ask a lot of those essential things in the debate. So that's on POI. Um, only on first minute until six minute. Anything outside that, you're not allowed to do POI. Next. Right, so let's go to it briefly how to win a debate. So you can win a debate by being persuas persuasive and to answer the burden. Um, I would say that one of the most important thing in winning a debate that is also forgotten a lot is characterization, right? So to be persuasive, you have to be characterizing. Characterization is a very popular method that is important because without characterizing something, we will never be able to be persuasive a lot of the time. But what type of characterization you should do? Right. So let's say that you were talking about those that motion again, the liberal uh, value. Feminists should impose liberal value in developing country. Um, I know it is tempting to characterize why we should not do this in opposition. Let's say that opposition might say we should not do this because people in developing country hate liberalism. That is tempting to do, right? Because that is going to help you to say, oh, we cannot do this because everybody don't like liberalism. Feminists will not achieve their goal. Now, that is tempting. However, that is not objectively true. And that is the thing. When you are speaking and characterizing things that is not objectively true, it's also easy to be rebutted. Why is it not objectively true? One, you say that everybody hate liberalism in developing country, but that is not true. We have developing in developing country. We still have a part of liberal community, right? In Indonesia, we still have liberal community. Or when we are talking about other developing country, let's just even talk about China. China still have a lot of liberal people inside of it. Actually, they are more liberal than developed country like South Korea. Actually. So that's in a sense something that you are missing on in the debate. You are characterizing under wrong status quo. You are characterizing things too extreme that it is not objectively true. So what you could do instead, right? You can be more moderate. It's okay to be honest about what the situation is. So you're able to make a biased perspective still by saying that not everybody hate liberalism in developing country, but it is true that developing country, majority of them are still highly cultural and highly religious, right? You can say that. So majority of the people are highly cultural and highly religious, and therefore they might not be exposed with a lot of liberal value. Therefore, therefore liberal value might still be opposed more because the majority are not accepting yet to what that point. So it's not everybody who hate it, but you're saying on why the majority that we need to consider when we are trying to enter a certain country and try to be able to create a campaign, right? So the conclusion of that is that feminism will have a hard time into convincing people that feminist is a good movement because they are associated with a value that is not accepted by the majority of the people. So that's what you could say in opposition instead of saying that everybody hates liberalism. So that's how you could be able to be persuasive as well because when you are um, being too extreme in characterization, a lot of the time you are not engaging, you become dismissive as well because you don't want to agree on what your opponent, opponent are saying, right? Because of course your opponent is going to say, no, 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 not everybody hates liberalism, but you're just going to argue, yeah, everybody hates liberalism. Therefore the debate would just be about he say, he say. That's how we create deadlock, and that's why debate sometimes deadlocking because everybody do not want to characterize further. They don't want to engage on the characterization of their opponent. So engaging on characterization is also a key point of winning a debate. So characterization, never forget about that. And the rest of it, you need to be persuasive and answer your burden, of course. Next. Right, so let's talk about motion. Uh, motion is basically a topic in the debate. Next, we're going to just directly jump on each motion. Uh, next, please. All right, so there are 
fourth type of motion that we are going to talk about in structure of debate. We have analysis motion, we have policy, we have retroactive, and we have actor. So let's go one by one with the analysis first. One of the most common motion you will ever see next. Right, so I think that everybody who at least debate once will be hearing this house believe that, right? It's everywhere. Now, um, in motion like this house believe that, this house oppose, this house support, this is an analysis type of debate. What does it mean? Your burden in analysis type of debate is to assess whether the value of a certain element or object or variable is more positive or negative, right? Um, and most of the time, it doesn't ask feasibility. So in a motion, this house believe that private university brings more harm than good. You don't need to talk about why people can get a why why the feasibility of it. There's no feasibility in this motion. What you need to prove is as simple as you why private university have more harm than good. And that's the comparative. It's as simple as that. It's a very honest debate, right? There is nothing hidden into it. It's you that's all you need to prove. All right, this house support the abolishment of private universities. Now, there is a word abolishment. Just because they say abolishment doesn't mean that you are expected to say how we will abolish, right? So that's a complete different thing. The burden is not to prove whether we can abolish private university. The debate need to go to what the assumption that we can abolish private university. But the more important burden that the motion want you to do is to prove why abolishing private university give you more benefit rather than having private university or what is the harm of private university so that is the strategic things that you are expected to do when it comes to what explaining analysis type of debate right next on contrary to that in policy type of debate you are expected to talk about implementation and feasibility because you need to talk about whether or not the policy should be implemented and whether or not it can be implemented right so usually it's not just about why x brings more harm than good but why the value achieve a specific threshold to compel the actor or the state to do something now in example to this this house would ban private university you need to talk about why is it the harm of private university force government to create a ban so that's what it meant to what why the value achieve a specific threshold compel actor to do something the harm has go to what extent that you think government need to ban right so that's the burden that you need to do so it's not just saying that private university is harmful but it's to say that it's harmful enough that it required government to ban them. So that is the burden, right? So it's different because in this house belief that before, you just need to prove that it has harm. It doesn't mean that you need to prove that it need abolishment or need to be banned, right? Just having harm is enough. But in this case, having harm is not enough because your opposition will prove that it does have harm, but it's not enough for you to ban, right? So that would be the argumentation in this type of motion. So implementation, why is it effective? Why is it necessary? Next. <coughs> right, so counterproposal and alternative in policy debate. Um, opposition is a lot of the time tempted to do this. But remember that in counterproposal in policy debate, if your opposition provide a reason not to do the policy, this is fine. Because opposition burden, again, is never to provide a counter proposal, but they can choose to defend status quo. So they can just say that status quo is enough. We don't need new policy, right? So that is an enough burden of opposition. Now, the same way that in case that opposition decided to create a counter proposal, let's say they think that status quo is not enough. We think that there should be a proposal, but it's not government proposal. The same number of fiat is also applicable. Fiat is the assumption that a debate can be done. So if government say that we want to ban private university um, because private university let's say is harmful as it is um, let's say that private university is harmful because it's capitalized education let's say you want to talk about that and opposition say that oh no 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 actually we don't want to ban private but we want to create another policy which is the um, hybrid 
implementation of private university by implementing government involvement let's say that's their policy then you need to also assume that it is likely for them to involve government in private university right so that's the same type of fiat so you need to also explain but of course they need to explain how the process of implementation involvement of government how how it works why it will works but you need to always assume that we have the same resources so if government said that we have have enough money to do something then opposition have the rights to say that we have enough money to do the counter proposal so that's the assumption of fiat that both sides have to have right so that's the thing and uh opposition need to also explain why it is necessary to the counter proposal you cannot just come to the debate and say that oh we don't want to debate the government side we don't want to debate status quo we want to debate counter proposal you need to actually prove and explain why counter proposal is necessary instead of defending status quo so that's something you should do okay next now in analysis but in a retroactive variation um, retroactive variation usually look like into this house regret and this house prefer motion so this house regret and this house prefer is unique because a lot of the time in this house regret the motion already access or the motion um, usually we're debating something that has happened or something that uh, something that has happened in the past or something that is still happening that is this house regret motion so an example of this house let's say this house regret the prevalence of private university in indonesian <clears throat> educational ecosystem it has happened right the prevalence of private university or when we debate about this house regret regret the rise of social media it has happened and it's currently happening the rise of social media or when we talk about this house regret the the popularization of um the popularization of a uh, feminist in pop culture it has happened right in music like taylor swift and beyonce so we are debating about something that has happened but what should you do in a retroactive variation is that you need to be able to talk about why something that has happened created an impact that you don't want right so you want to talk about that something that has happened turns out to be bad and we want something else right we want something different happening and therefore we regret it so the, uh, when we talk about this house regret the prevalent prevalence of private university in indonesia education system your expectation is to have an education that is not as capitalized and you believe that this become more capitalized because the prevalence of private universities right so that's the assumption the harm exists because this is happening and you don't like the harm you want something else to happen and in order for that benefit to happen we cannot have this right that's what you regret so that's like the current uh, the the logical flow of debating in this house regret motion so basically you talk about that uh, and you need to provide antithesis antithesis in here is that you are expected to explain why your world will be better so you need to talk about why without such element why without the prevalence of private university the situation will get better okay the story is saying why without social media life will be better so that kind of assumption right so that's something that you need to talk about and it is not a fiat um you cannot just assume life will get better just because social media doesn't exist you need to explain why it will be like that right so that's the thing and this house prefer motion is also similar in a way that you need to explain on the extent on which the statement is true and you need to talk about why you prefer that situation over other thing the comparative is usually a new thing compared to status quo so if the motion is this house prefer a world which educational system is entirely run by state the comparative shouldn't be anything new the comparative should be status quo where we have state and we have private okay so that's what opposition should do opposition cannot make a new case or if the debate say that this house prefer a world which educational system is entirely run by state instead of private then the comparative should be comparing private versus state right and opposition need to defend stay um, private instead of state so you should always take on the motion comparative it's usually a compared to status quo or a compared to b but never a compared to c because c doesn't exist in the motion okay next and last about this is that we're going to talk about the actor um 
same burden actually with everything else with this house with this house believe that the different the difference is that the other type of motion require you to talk about the neutral perspective of stakeholder right you are as the third party or as government a lot of the time but in actor debate you need to acknowledge the interest the knowledge the value of that actor so if you're debating as public universities this house would actively call for the abolition of private university you can not just generally say why the abolishment of private university is important or good talk about why is it that this is something that public university want to do why is this within their interest so that's the most important thing in the motion and become an important burden as well right but the entire other thing is similar you need to analyze the harms you need to create the policy if it is a policy debate vice versa but the add-on in here is the interest of the debate interest of the speak um, of the stakeholder next um we can skip this next um next again uh, next again we have discussed this um yeah just a bit about knifing it's an important term so knifing means that when closing team contradict the model or principle of your opening again like i mentioned before you need to be complete you need to have a new idea and you need to be different but doesn't mean that you need to be contradicting okay that's different um, so contradiction can also happen between first speaker and second speaker, and you would like to avoid that. The example of this is when your first speaker say that we want to ban private university completely, and then the second speaker say we don't want to ban it completely. We want to only ban some of it, right? That's contradiction, and that could be harmful to your case. It wouldn't directly give you a again you will not get punished but it will be a point of discredit it just means that your case wouldn't be as compelling and wouldn't be as persuasive because which is it do you believe that it should be banned entirely or it should not be banned entirely um same with closing and opening but next right so i try to make this as compactful as possible because there are a lot of room to actually being um discuss on especially on motion there's so many interesting things we can talk about motion and topic in motion is also different if you're talking about let's say economy you talk about politics you talk about social movement or you talk about philosophy that will be different but um i hope that in the entire brief of explanation of motion structure of the debate structure of speaker's role and um bp debate in general i hope that you guys get an understanding of that and it could be helpful for you uh, in preparing yourself for nudc um, this is just an overview how the speaker score in NUDC look like. I think that this can be an inspiration for you. Um, and actually, I think that um, you can take a look at this later after the session. But basically, we don't start from 1 to 100. We usually start from 64, right? So, um, the, uh, sorry, 50, right? We start from 50. And this is like the kind of description that you can try to aim for. So this could be a good tracking point as well. Because when you go to a competition and you see that, oh, in this competition, I get 70. And 70 means this. Um, next, please. Right, so 70 means that your argument are relevant, explanation is there, but sometimes difficult to follow. So you get the point that, oh, I want to aim to be 73, 75 next time. That means that I need to make a more clear enough point to follow. So this could be a like, a like kind of tracking system where you could be able to track your performance as well of course that speaker score is not everything please do not like um please don't put speaker score as your entire goal in debate because like there are more things than speaker score you can track your improvement differently but i just find it um fun sometimes to track improvement uh, from my own speech based on the speaker score that i get again different system different debate have different scoring standard different judge also might view the scoring differently because like my seven this 73 73 75 if i see a speaker i might give 74 but other um judge might give 73 or might give 75 right that because like the characterization is the same it's just different on how we perceive it so that's also different so don't be too bummed up if you get low score uh, but just think of it as like room of improvement if you get low speaker point it just means that you need to improve but doesn't mean that you 
are not capable of improvement, right? And doesn't mean that it define you entirely as a person. It might just be about that round. It might just be the scoring that is different. Um, it just what I'm saying is that the message that should you receive in that situation is that you need improvement, but doesn't mean that you should be too calm up about it. There are a lot more other important things rather than just scoring, but this is the range that you could try to uh, be able to see as well. So I think that it's important as a debater to understand the scoring range because a lot of the time debater only see judge range because you need to score the judge, but I think that you need to also see scoring range on a speaker basis as a debater. So yeah. Uh, this is a scoring range and you can go next again to see the um, last part of it. Uh, next. Uh, next, okay. Uh, next again. Yep. Uh, 95 200, but I don't think that there is someone that ever get 90 speaker score. I think that the highest I ever heard is 89. I never heard of a 90, but I have heard of 89 in one competition so if you could get to 100 i that would be very awesome but i don't think that we have that um nowadays it's completely a life-changing speech right so basically that's all for my session today i hope that um this is on time i hope this uh it helped for you and like we can go on to what the next uh part of the webinar thank you everyone and see you on q a bye okay thank you so much it's, uh, it's very, very uh, important material from Kat Jessica. We can know the structure of debate, what is NVDC, and we can see that how the team calls, the opening, the closing, and uh, how the judge uh, judging our debate. Thank you for Kat Jessica. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we now uh, open our Q&A session for Kat Jessica. It's Kat Jessica here. Okay, uh, uh, we are uh, I given three chance for participants to ask questions to Kak Jessica. So if you want to ask, please open your camera first and then introduce yourself first. Or if you camera is broken, you can type it in the chat room. Oh yeah, but please uh, raise hand first, and then do it yourself. Okay, I see uh, already two people raise hands. Okay, the first one I'm gonna choose Liharti. Okay, for Liharti, please turn on the camera and introduce yourself first. Okay. So oh, for Liharti, time is yours. Okay, uh, before we start the question is hello sis jessica hi um can i speak in bahasa uh yeah boleh silakan um tadi kan membahas tentang POI ya kan kak jadi um, saya sangat tertarik gitu dalam dunia debat namun saya belum pernah mengikuti debat jadi uh, dengan ikut webinar inilah saya ingin mengetahui bagaimana struktur-struktur debat dan sebagainya jadi untuk pertanyaannya mengenai POI itu saya masih kebingungan di mana saya pernah melihat uh, uh, suatu debat di, uh, pihak lawannya itu apabila pihak lawan terus melakukan POI Uh, apakah itu masuk penilaian juri dan kita yang sebagai uh, lawan mereka uh, apakah boleh uh, tidak uh, menyetujui mereka untuk uh, melakukan POI karena mereka sudah terus berulang kali melakukan POI, POI, POI begitu kak, apakah masuk ke penilaian juri uh, baik itu saja kak, terima kasih 
Oke, okay, terima kasih untuk pertanyaannya. Um, aku bantu jawab pakai bahasa Indonesia juga, nggak apa-apa. Campur-campur aja kita. Um, jadi kalau misalnya di dalam POI itu sendiri, tadi aku udah mention kalau POI itu penting. Dan kalau misalnya um, ada etika untuk ngelakuin POI, um, maksudnya adalah ketika kita ngelakuin POI, kita nggak boleh terlalu sering POI, POI, POI sampai ngeganggu. Terutama kalau POI dari uh, dari apa ya dari unmute gitu ketika kita unmute terus kita terus terusan POI kan bakal ngeganggu dan itu biasanya bisa dijadikan isu untuk um, equity violation atau kayak pelanggaran um, etika di debat jadi kayak bisa ada reminder dari juri tapi ketika uh, mereka ngelakuin POI kita udah terima sekali terus mereka POI POI terus pertanyaannya apa akan dikonsider dengan juri konsiderasi juri itu bukan jumlah POI nya tapi kualitas dari POI. Jadi yang bakalan dilihat itu adalah kualitasnya. Jadi kalaupun yang lakuin POI banyak, tapi kalau pertanyaannya nggak relevan, maka poinnya juga nggak sesignifikan itu. Sama juga dengan kita, walaupun kita terima POI banyak, tapi jawaban kita nggak terlalu relevan dengan POI-nya, um, kreditnya juri bakalan lebih ke yang ngasih POI. Jadi tergantung kualitasnya. Tapi uh, balik lagi, kalau kita udah terima POI sekali, kita dan kita mau fokus ke kasus kita nggak masalah. Jadi kayak makanya uh, threshold-nya kan paling nggak terima sekali. Dan kalau misalnya kita nggak mau terima, um, uh, I understand kalau misalnya kita baru debat pasti nervous, tiba-tiba ditanyain di depan uh, banyak orang. Nah, nggak um, terima POI belum tentu kita kalah ya, belum tentu kita bakalan kayak nggak dapat poin menang. Tapi itu cuman kayak kadang terlihatnya kita nggak mau engage, nggak mau nggak um, mau engage aja, terlihat terkesannya seperti itu. Tapi balik lagi penilaian juri bakalan bergantung sama seluruh komponen dari um, speechnya kita. Jadi uh, itu juga bentuk konsiderasi. Tapi paling nggak coba untuk selalu um, biasakan untuk terima satu. Walaupun mungkin nervous, tapi itu bisa jadi praktis yang bagus untuk lomba nantinya. Semoga menjawab. Oke, terima kasih Kak. Itu yang sangat penting dan sangat berguna untuk uh, saya ke depannya. Nice to meet you Kak Jessica. Have a nice day. Have a nice day as well. Thank you Lee Harti for the... Oke, okay. selanjutnya tadi aku ada nampak yang lain, satu lagi, GCO, oke. Okay. For GCO, uh, if you can turn on your camera, please turn on your camera, and then please introduce yourself, and then ask for the uh, Hello, firstly, I'm sorry, I can't turn my camera on, because my condition is not supporting at all. Uh, nice. Oke, okay, Kak, Jessica, I want to ask about with positions, Sometimes it is happened to me. Uh, I want to bring new point from my member, but that my member is not bring at all. But sometimes I afraid that uh, the new point is going to be new point accounting by judging. So how we can create the new point is that it's not like new point. It's not like it's not, but it is still relevant with my member. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say to not bring a new point um, as in completely new point on your member at all, if it's possible, because like, again, you wouldn't get credit for that. The ideal situation would be to have your member to say that, right? To be able to brought that new point so you could be able to extend it. That is the ideal situation. But sometimes there are things that is important, but you think about it late. Let's say that um, you just think about that idea after your member speech let's say that's the situation and you think that is important i think that you can try to slip it on as a rebuttal right so you can think of a if you cannot think of a relevant point that you can extend from your member you can think of a relevant point from your opponent and try to slip that in as a form of um, rebuttal instead that's also possible even though that sometimes the judge would definitely somehow know that you're trying to slip in a new point but that is like uh, the strategy you could do when you want to slip in a new point but the ideal situation again you need to always um, give the new point to your member so you can make extension again new point in here doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have a logical explanation but it just means that you need to have um, to, you need to make sure that there is conclusion from it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, ada suara. Oke. Okay. I hope that answer. Thank you, Pak. Clear. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, oh, yeah.
Okay. Now, uh, I see someone who asking uh, in the chat room, Kak Jessica. Can you see? No. From Stephanie Ross. Um, oh, you want oh, oh, it? Oh, oh, see, it's not for me. Okay, I just gonna read it. From Stephanie Ross to Kak Jessica. Hi, I would like to ask about Kak Jessica first experience on the debate competition. How was the nerves? And any tip of first timer on the debate competition? Uh, sorry, what is the question? Uh, a bit laggy, oh. soalnya. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Ross asked, uh, what is Kak Jessica's first experience on the debate competition? And how was the nerves? And any tips of first timers on the debate competition? Um, okay, thank you, Stephanie, for the question. Um, I would say I was lucky. My first competition was with a senior. So I have a senior that accommodated me in that competition. And I feel less nervous because everybody's there. Like I have friends, I have my coach there, I have my senior always assuring me that I do well, even though I don't. So my first competition is a local competition in Medan. And it's an offline competition. Um, it was back in 2016. I cannot even speak for seven minutes yet. I have my senior telling me all the things I need to do during case building. It's like, oh, just bring this in the first, bring this in the second. This is completely being carried by uh, my senior. And that was like, I will never forget that experience because like, it's scary. I understand it's very scary. Um, however, the way that I tone down the nervousness is to prepare a lot. So. I know that I will go to a competition one month from now. So what I do as a completely newbie is that to complete to look for a way to practice. I read a lot of materials. I debate a lot, um, like a lot, a lot. I debate uh, almost every day because of like, I'm not saying that you should abandon all of the things you do and debate every day, okay? Just like try to make a planning on make sure that you are accustomed with speech. I think that we also have like national um, sparring every week now, and that could be a very good opportunity for you to be accustomed with how debate um, look like. I think that you can try to um, apply for sparring and um, tips for you to be able to get less nervous. I would say um, try to understand that that is your first debate. So whatever happened, that happened because it's your first. You cannot really control the result. You might not get a good result at all, but the first is, a, is the step that you need to take, right? So um, even though that you might feel afraid and stuff, just remember that this is your first step and it's okay to not do well. And if you don't do well, that's okay. If you do well, that is amazing, right? So that's the thing that I would be able to say to you. And I think that what you could try to do as well is to look for friends. I think that you can ask for different people. I think debate people are very, very nice. You can reach out to any of like debaters and ask them tips. They will answer it for you. They will not like say, who are you? I don't want to talk to you. They won't do that, right? So reach out to anyone. And you can also reach out to me if you have question. If I have the time, I will answer as well. But just like be brave enough to reach out. That's okay. And try to be able to do a lot of different practices to be able to get the grabs about debate. That would be my suggestion. I hope that answer. Oh, okay, okay. So you're going to NSDC. Good luck for that. There's a long way to practice. I think that you can do a lot of different research as well. And if you want to do spotting, I think that people just like ask people around. I think that there are a lot of people who would do that. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Stephanie. Okay. I, uh, now we close our presentation for Kajisika. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, all the answer, Kajisika. And we want to say thank you too for all the materials that Kajisika has given to us because it's so very important for us and even for the first timer on debate it's really, really help them to uh, improve themselves to be a uh, best debater. okay thanks so much uh, okay uh, i guess before we enter our second speaker maybe we can do an ice breaking a little bit firstly uh, firstly i want to invite our master ceremony to come and join me in this ice breaking section but firstly i want to say uh, if someone who wants to ask uh, asking a question again don't worry because we often create a session again in a uh, second speaker so just prepare yourself so uh, in this ice breaking session i will call and our master ceremony to join me in this section so 
Tara. Bye, guys. Okay, so... What are we gonna play now, Pak Alian? Okay, Fahri, we're gonna play Who's Is This Game? Can you explain to the participant what is Who's Is This Game? Uh, okay, so guess who's this game? It's the game that we have. Uh, we will show you a picture of a famous people and then we will zoom it and you guys must guess it who's that. Okay, to answer, uh, to answer the question, uh, just type uh, on the chat room. So, uh, Uh, you can guess the answer and type it uh, on the chat room. Okay, repeat again. This guess who's this game that we will share. Uh, uh here the okay. we will share the screen the picture of a famous people, and then you will guess it who is that. To answer it, just type it in the chat room. Okay. It's okay if you if it's wrong or right because we were just having fun now. Because uh, after listening all of the material, maybe we can have fun a little bit before the second speakers. Okay, uh, our operator maybe can show for the first person. Okay. Okay, I see those two, two eyes. Two okay. Eyes. Who's gonna eat? Oh, there's uh, someone guessing. The CEO said it Obama, Barack Obama. Oh. And Muhammad Umar said Barack Obama. There's so, there's so many. Okay. Jo- Jokowi. Oh, Someone Jokowi. said it's Jokowi. I guess that's Jokowi. I, oh. so far, no? hmm. I think it's correct. Aldebaran. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Oh. We'll count uh, three. Okay, we will see the answer now. Okay. We count from three, three two, two, one. one. That's wow. Barack Obama. Congratulations for all the people. Barack Obama. Okay, for the... Second picture. Second picture. Can the operator show it to us? Yeah. Oh, oh. who's it? Is that? <laughs> okay. Someone said Joko we don't Joko know. Joko we don't know. Is it right? Is that correct? Why oh, does someone answer Joko we don't know? I see. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, here. But Joko, Joko okay. Another. Another. Is there another answer? Another answer. Say so Joko we. Oh, there's a lot of Obama. Get Obama is already there. Already. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we're gonna. Okay, I think we. Uh, for the uh, answer. Uh, three, two, two, one. one. That's yeah, part of the video. Question, question for all. The answer. answer okay. <laughs> Next. One? Third picture. Oh, okay, yeah. I see those red lips here. Ooh, who's the lips? Who Taylor? Oh, oh, my <laughs> oh my god, Ariana. Someone say it's Ariana. Tell us it's mm-hmm. Selena. Gomez. I just want to give in. Ooh, she's, she's the a icon. She's icon. She's a singer. She's a singer. She's the icon. She's a pep- famous and. And the uh, we are the Barbie. One Barbie. I think it's correct. Okay, we're going to reveal the answer. Apa hari? Three, three, two, two one. one. That's Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay. Next, we have uh, another picture again. Okay. Oh, Ooh. this. <laughs> Who smile is it? Ma- oh, Ooh, someone said Maui. 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 You're so fast. Kim Jong Un. <laughs> hmm, I see. Are you thinking? Yeah. Think, think, think. Selfie said it's my Yudi Oh, Obama again. <laughs> That's my job. Boy, boy. Okay. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. That's my job. Tip two. Okay. Bu Megawati, Bu Jawabannya. Can we reveal the answer, Pahri? Okay. Three, Three, two, two one. one. Maudi Ayunda. Okay. And wait, we have the last picture the last here. Picture. Oh, oh, can you guys guess who is this? Oh my, oh my God, you are so fast, guys. My husband. <laughs> <laughs> They're like... Fahri, yes, that's Fahri. <laughs> is it you, Fahri? <laughs> <laughs> my twin, you oh, that's My twin, you oh, oh my God. God. Sure. Is Obama. Is there no, no one gonna guess it? Obama or Joko Widodo? Everyone's twin. Oh my god. You my got it wrong. My ex, wow. <laughs> is it true? Okay. 
Zainali. Yes, that's the right answer. Okay. okay. Congratulations for all the people that answered think, the correct answer. Okay. I think that's all. What, yeah. That's all the picture we got. Okay. We're having. Thank you for gonna, inviting me, Fahri. We're gonna continue our next section. But firstly, we're gonna say goodbye to Kak Adel. Goodbye, Good, everyone. Goodbye, Kak Adel. See you later. See you later. Okay, back with me again. <laughs> okay, uh, time. Uh, it's time to move to the next session. Uh, because we are now fresh again and stay focused again. And as I told you, at the end of the speaker, there will be a Q and A and games that the three lucky person will get amazing gift from us. So don't forget to be focused and listen to our speakers today. Okay, well, I keep you waiting. Let me introduce our speaker. Our second speaker today. Our second uh, speaker today has the work experience at the Rio Debate Foundation, English Debate Tournament Deputy Chief Adjudicator 2023, English Festival Faculty Economy and Business Rio Diversity Debate Tournament Chief Adjudicators, Iron Reef 2022 Debate Tournament Chief Adjudicator NUDC Real University Selection 2022, Chief Adjudicator of Forcom KDBE National 2021 and 2022, as the Chief Adjudicators, Multiple NUDC 2022 University Real Faculty Selection Chief Adjudicator, and two more. And the achievement that the speaker achieved, wow, there's a lot of achievement that our speaker achieved from as the first best speaker and gold medalist of National University Debating Championship Novice category on national level by Cameron Deputy 2021, champion of NUDC 2021 competition on regional level, champion of, champion and overall best speaker of NUDC 2021 Rio University selection, and there is nine more achievements. Okay, without keep it waiting, let me call Ka Jeremy Joy. Hi everyone. Uh, am I? Hi. Am Hello, I how are you? you? Yes, you are double. Okay. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you. And you? I'm fine. Okay. Maybe uh, you can start your presentation, and I give time to you. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, basically, today I'm going to share how to build argument and rebuttal in a, in a best fashion. But the disclaimer, uh, th this is not a fixed template. This is not an absolute way to make an argument. This is just a method that I find after years effective for me, and you guys might also apply it to you. Okay, I also think that you did not have to follow this entirely you may uh, adopt some of it and, and then uh, integrate it into your own style uh, and pick up more information that you deem best and most effective for you. Okay, uh, next we should start. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, the most of new debater mindset on making argument on debating tends to be a little bit of mistaken because most of us, most of new debater that uh, really fresh from the oven uh, made argument for the sake of we need one, right? Uh, the essence is argument and rebuttal should not be made just because you need one. Instead, your mindset as a new debater needs to revolve around how do you sell an idea to the judges, right? It's entirely. You need to convince the judge to believe that your idea is something that is very good, exclusive, and something that is worth their time or worth buying, right? So if we pretend that this chair is an argument, how can we sell this argument to the judge? Uh, is that anyone want to try? How can we sell this argument chair to the judge? Uh, do anyone wants to try? 
I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Okay, uh, assuming that, oh, step seven, you want to try? Okay, if you want oh, yes. to try it. Hello, can you hear my voice? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you can. Okay, um, firstly, I would like to ask you uh, on your needs of a chair. Would you mm. like one? Uh, how, what is your preference of a chair? Mm. Uh, then I would ask you on what's your budget on a chair. And I would convince you to uh, slowly ease into buying this one chair I'm supposed to sell. I think that's what how, how I would do it. Okay, how do you convince me to buy this specific chair that you want to sell? I think I would focus on the positives, like many people would, and I would uh, specify on the little quirks of this chair that most other chairs wouldn't have. Which is? It has a rolling chair. It's, it's a wheelie chair. It's really comfortable. It's sofa like so you're very comfortable when you're sitting on it and you wouldn't feel back pain when you're sitting on it because it's a comfortable chair okay sure uh, is there anything else uh i can't really think of any right now okay sure okay thank you stephanie thank you uh, uh taking off from that analysis we can add so much more, right? Not only that this is a wheelie chair, which makes it very practical to move around. It's not going to cost you a lot of energy, for example, in office or in whatever place to move around. It is also made of steel, means that it is very long-term. It's not going to be broken or corroded. So it is stainless steel and stuff and so on. It is made of leather. It is easy to clean. It is very comfortable and so on and so forth, right? We are selling the, the qualities of the chair to make it, as appealing as possible, and also whether or not this chair is uh, in line with the buyers or the consumer's budget, right? This is how we sell a chair. We are going to advertise uh, the quality, the importance, and the convenience, right? Upon who needs this chair more, for example, and why this chair is very different. We did, uh, we did not want to sell a chair that looks like something that is not worth buying, right? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, committee. Okay, we should not sell an argument that looks like this, right? Because this chair is not verifiable. But if you are a competitor in selling chair, how can you persuade the consumer to not buy this particular chair? How can you rebut this argument of chair? Somebody wants to try? Uh, sure, Michael, Mikhail. I want to rebut the argument. Uh, I need to say uh, the chair is too expensive to us because uh, with the function, we can get the uh, kursi yang lebih murah daripada uh, kursi yang tadi, padahal memiliki fungsi yang sama. Uh, okay, uh, to be more specific, if this is the picture, this blue chair is our opponents are going to sell. For example, how can we prevent the judge from buying this chair? This blue chair, this particular blue chair that are our opponent, our competitor advertised to the judge. Uh, okay. I think the way that I'm gonna say to the judge is to say that this blue chair is more easier to move around because it is more lighter than the previous uh, black chair, I think. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the how the most effective way to prevent the judge from buying this chair argument, the first thing we need to point out that it, it only have three legs, right? One leg is missing from this chair. Entirely different from our previous argument or from our previous fancy chair where it have four legs, we can argue 
and rebut this chair argument by saying that it is not stable. Whoever sit on it will most likely fall, and moreover, it is made from plastic. So this is exactly how, uh, in analogy, for example, how we should treat an argument and a rebuttal, right? In argument, we need to advertise our argument's qualities by saying why it is good, who are this good for, and then on the other hand, the moment that we want to prevent the judge from buying that argument, we need to look upon the qualities on the flaws that we need to point out that this argument is not worth buying, that it has some flaws, it is unstable, and it is unreliable and not convenient at all. So the problem in a new debater is that we made a rebuttal for the sake of having one. I think what most of you guys need to develop first is the ability to make argument based on what you need to sell as opposed to just having one. Okay, we're going to the next slide then. Okay, this is, once again, this is not an absolute template. This is something that I developed myself around years that I found this is effective for me. Feel free to cherry pick and integrate some issues to your case. I think there are three uh, major components in argument that are going to make your claim significantly much more appealing, right? Because before this, I think every motion that arises have problems and it have actors, right? Every motion have problems relies on them. And then based on your side, whether you're the government or the opposition, you need to position your claim to prove or disprove the problem, whether or not you are going to solve the problem with your claim, with your argument, or whether or not yeah. you're going to worsen the problem or you're not going to solve the problem, or is there, a, is there any other way to solve the problem if you are the opposition side, like the previous speaker have told you upon the opposition approach and so on and so forth. But I think there are three things that are very important. Firstly, whether your argument is true on the level of truthfulness of the argument. Mm -hmm. Secondly, upon the importance of the argument. And thirdly, upon the impact of the argument. It is worth noting that let's look at this like graphic. Uh, if your argument is entirely true, but it is not important, it is not as appealing as a true and important argument. Just as if, if your argument is important, but it is factually wrong, it is also not appealing, right? So it's very important to have and cover up every aspect in an argument. Before we get into the example, let's talk about what is truthfulness? Truthfulness is whether or not your claim, your heading, uh, please try again. Uh, I'm sorry, what should I try again? Are you talking to me or? Okay, you might. I'm just going to continue anyway. Uh, truthfulness talk about whether or not your claim is true, whether on the abstract level, level or whether or not your claim is true in practical level. So you need to prove if you are going to claim, oh, this is this is going to bring safety for the society and so on and so forth. You need to. A proof on the truthfulness level why your claim will protect the people and so on and so forth. So you should not talk. So, so you sh we should not talk about uh, why a thing is good or bad. But you need to prove upon your claim. But secondly, about the importance of the argument, you need to explain then why your argument matters. Why your argument needs to be believed on and what need needs to be bought on. Uh, more, more often than not, the easiest way to do this is uh, saying that your argument is going to protect some certain groups in the society, whether it is minority, whether it is the liberal group, whether it is a disenfranchised woman in patriarchal states, for example, whether it is uh, labor, for example, they are oppressed by capitalism or by the oligarch, for example, and so on and so forth. Because if it is true that your argument are going to protect some part of the society, you also need to prove why they are worthy of your moral compass of protection, why they are worthy of the sustained moral compass of protection, and so on and so forth. But thirdly, I think you also need to talk about impact. 
uh, impact is when your argument and your claim is manifested that if it is um, going to be concretized, how your argument are going to bring changes, uh, how your argument are going to be bring changes to bring protection or serve whatever utility that you aim from the first place, right? Okay, so this is the three most important component. Let's uh, let's apply it to most classic motions, right? Uh, next, please. Okay, let's a very classic motion. Let's say the motion is in Zeus. Uh, let's say that the problem in Zeus is that there are so many mistreated animals and there are so many uh, private zoos that are irresponsible. So let's say that the most obvious claim that we can make is that zoos as a place tend to harm and abuse and also mistreat the animals, therefore we ban them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the truthfulness level, what we need to prove is that why the zoos are more likely and tend, mm -hmm. tend to harm the animal even if there are things like uh, protocols and so on and so forth. Firstly, you can analyze it is just true because zoos operate like a company and often money shortage happen because of the uncertainty of visitor coming. This tend to limit the capacity of zoo to provide the needs of animal. Moreover, you can also add on analysis about money uh, spending that private sector that have profit orientation, the moment that the money income are not going to cover up the money output, the company and the zoos will not uh, lay it upon from their own pocket to make sure that the animals still have the quality they deserve. They are going to pressurize the output even at the expense of uh, sacrificing the animal to begin with. But B, this is also true, that we are also anyway going to harm the animals, assuming even if there are money, you can analyze the nature of zoo's operational system, which engage the animal, limit their freedom and interaction from mother nature, which posit psychological damage to the animal identity and natural way of life that significantly make them unhappy. So basically what we just did is that firstly, we prove that the harm and the mistreatment happen because more often than not, when zoos did not have money, they are unable to provide what the mother nature can provide for the animal. You can also add on examples and analysis like food, sanitation, or fat, for example, medical treatment, sanitizing, for example, or even uh, other needs that the animals might need for example, and why it is inherently expensive, why hiring workers and medical <coughs> staff is very expensive, and more often than not, if Zeus didn't have money, and more often than when it happened, this tend to abuse the animal. But B, we also prove that even if there are money, we can, we can analyze that the Zeus operational system take away the most identical uh, part of the animal's life, which is freedom, which is why they can uh, be a subject of mother nature in and of itself and posit psychological damage to the identity and so on and so forth. So if we say this is true because of with or without money, we are going to take away something from the animal which harm their way of life. Mm -hmm. So this is how we prove that this is, it is true that zoos tend to harm and abuse the animal. But yeah. true is not enough. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, after we talk about why this is true, also we need to talk about why it is important. We can say that the analysis is important because animals are sentient beings, that they are capable of pain and feeling, and humans know this. And it's very important as a civilized country and society to acknowledge other living beings right and to not treat them as a means to an end especially as an object to obtain money at the expense of sacrificing their natural way of life. What we did in this first analysis, we are analyzing upon the reason why zoos and the private sector should not harm the animal. It is because they are an important subject of, my, of a civilized country and society. 
that they are capable of pain and feeling, and as human with rationality, with mind and with knowledge that oh they do feel pain and do, they do feel pressure, it is very important for us to not treat as an object merely to obtain money, especially when we sacrifice them. Uh, but moreover, it is very important also to ban this because the essence of responsibility that since Zeus has taken away this animal from babies and separated them from their mothers, but Zeus failed to be responsible to give a meaningful life for those innocent, innocent living creatures. The second thing that we just did is that we say this is very important to ban and to prevent this harm that the Zeus are inflicting. It is because Zeus has taken away these animals, babies, without consent and separate separated them from their mothers for they have entanglement with, for example, they have connection and so on and so forth. That is, it's the right of mother and mother nature to uh, have custody of this baby. But Zeus not only steal them without consent, Zeus also failed to be responsible and give them a meaningful life. And then we can link this back to the claim that it is very important to prevent the harm that Zeus are going to inflict because not only animals are able to feel pain and feeling, but it is also because they are stolen without consent and they are separated and they are not being provided with the best meaningful life and so on and so forth. So this is the important aspect of that claim, right? But thirdly, what we can talk about is next, uh, the impact. Impact, uh, if we are going to apply it to the claim, if the claim is true that the zoos do mistreat and misconduct the animals and that the only way for us to prevent this misconduct is from banning is that we're going to have some impact if we, uh, if we uphold the argument and the motion. Firstly, you can analyze that if we ban zoos, we are going to save the animals from mistreatment and misconduct save them from a natural life habit and give them the wild freedom they deserve. So the, this, the nature of this analysis is that we are we, uh, indirectly say that the moment that we ban zoos, we are going to prevent more mistreatment and then we are going to have to release them to the nature or to sanctuary or to suaka alam and so on and so forth and give them the freedom they deserve, right? So we are going to save the animals. But B, there are other impacts. Uh, impact does not necessarily means that you can only have one, you can have multi. But secondly, we can give an important message to the society and children that it is never okay to treat any living being like that, to steal them from their mothers and engage them. And you are going to taught society and children that it is not a civilized way to harm sentient beings like animals and so on and so forth. Moreover, we can also add on that the moment that we can taught the society that it is never okay to harm other sentient beings, we also enforce them to not harm a fellow humans, for example, and so on and so forth. We can give a very important message that the state recognize the well-being of living creature more than the state recognize money. Of course, before we talk about truthfulness, importance, and impact, of course, you need to play on the big government first. You need to explain how big is the harm? Therefore, the state have a responsibility or authority to ban this private sector, for example, right? But after this, we can uh, pull on an impact that is very good because we give a stronger stance that the state and the society oppose any harms in any form, right? But see, we, the third impact is we can redirect this uh, need or activity to Taman Safari, for example, which operate in a better way where animals roam free and human faces in cage and we get entertainment and the animals remain happy. So basically what we just did here, we have three impacts. Firstly, the impact is we save the animals. So the, 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 this first impact is for the animal as the subject of the argument, but we are not going to benefit the animal only. We also sell a point that we are going to benefit the society and children also by enforcing a stronger stance in the government that are opposing harm. But, but the third impact is we are 
are not going to abolish any interaction from animal. We are not going to abolish any uh, knowledge upon how the nature works, how the animals operate, and what do they look like, education, and so on and so forth. What we are saying is that this activity may remain exist, which operate in a better way. So even if we ban zoos, animals and society that are uh, animal loving and so on and so forth that needs education upon wildlife and so on and so forth can still access this in another way that also exists in status quo, right? So what we just did upon just one claim, we are proving that the claim is true, that the animals are harmed anyway. And the one that is harming them is Zeus in most of circumstances. But we be what we just did is that we have proven why the animal should not be harmed since the zoos are harming them anyway, why the animals are worthy of our moral compass, that it is not, should not be harmed. But thirdly, the impact is the moment that we implement the motion, for example, or your claim, we're going to save the animal, give an important message, and redirect any education and knowledge upon animals who like to come and suffer and so forth. So what we just did is, we completely talk about every aspect on why your argument are the most appealing in the debate. Okay. Uh, upon the next example, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, another very classic motion. Let's talk about this house will legalize prostitution. I know this uh, might be a little bit off, but it is a very classic motion. But Let's say that the problem in status quo, of course, we need to identify the problem first and the actor first, that because every motion have their own problem, okay? uh, the most obvious problem we can identify in this motion is that, uh, firstly, there are financial problems, that there are many people that are dislocated, that they have no other way to, to survive, to provide for themselves. But secondly, this uh, this unpopular industry, for example, do have safety issues, right? So the mo what we want to do is that how can we solve this problem on our side in the government by implementing the motion, right? So I think the most of the most obvious claim we can make is that legalization would lead into a better and safer environment for both the provider and the consumer of this somewhat unpopular industry. Okay, so the claim needs to prove why the problem that we identify earlier will be solved <clears throat> at the end of the day. But before we talk about the truthfulness and so on and so forth, we need to establish first that legal or not, prostitution will always exist and find its marker in society no matter what country and border. Also that this is this unpopular industry has lasted for thousands of years, even from the beginning of society itself, that this unpopular industry exists and dominated cities and countries. It is somewhat uh, the most ancient industry we may, we, we may know. And after years of criminalization, the world and countries is nowhere near close to shut down this activity, meaning either way it will always be there, right? So what we just did is, what we just did is on our side, we say that whether or not we legalize or not, this will remain exist and this will remain last even thousands of years after life, our lifetime. Therefore, it is not, uh, it does not really make any changes. Oh, okay. This doesn't really make any changes whether or not we're going to criminalize it or not because we legalize this uh, it's going to yeah be there anyway right you can also mechanize for example give mechanism upon how we, we can legalize this prostitution right for example there are a specific area of this unpopular industry that there are there are only a certain place or city that this industry might may exist and so on and so forth but nextly we can also say that instead of Instead, we should legalize to impose safety protocols and to set syntax. Yeah, syntax is a purpose. The syntax purpose is to discourage the society to buy or use certain product. So after we establish this first by saying that 
no matter what happens, it will always exist. And what shall we do uh, instead? Only after then we can talk about the component of the argument itself. Uh, next. Okay, let's say that the claim is still same. Uh, we can say that this is true because firstly, we can characterize what legalization means. We can characterize and define legalization means that there are recognition from the government. In this case, it is to recognize that this job and market do exist. Right? This is the first thing that we need to analyze first. And then the subject of this market, provider or consumer, is protected by the law from any harms. So basically what we just said is that we characterize legalization means protection from the government that they are a subject of law. If we are going to compare this to the status quo that the provider and the consumer is a criminal, right? They, they, are, uh, they are a very bad person which the state are not going to protect anyway. So in the status quo, if uh, a prostitute came to the police, uh, police office, and say that, oh, I am abused and so on and so forth, they will not bother to respond to your uh, report. Instead, they are going to engage you and investigate you, right? So this is what would happen in status quo most of the time. And then the, the next analysis after we compare to that, we can say that the state now can impose safety protocol, i.e. impose safety in the course, intercourse using safety measure, for example, we can impose data collection from consumer and provider before any activity and prohibit any intercourse if there are risks of diseases. And we can protect the service provider from customer abuse or musicari abuse, where, whether it is forcefully drug the worker or unequal pay, etc. And any breach of this protocol are subject of law and may be reported and so on and so forth. So what we just did, we just say that the, the reason why it is true that legalization will provide a better and safer environment is the reason is that the state can uh, opt in into pro serving protection and serving justice and serving regulation and impose protocol to further the market, right? Because the problem with this unpopular market is that there are many STD, for example, sexual transmitted diseases, there are many uh, uh, drugs involved in the in the industry it's also, right? There are so many other illegal things that are correlated by this pop unpopular market. So the reason why we can make it a safer environment is the moment that government has a hang of control upon this unpopular market, they can uh, step by step eradicate, for example, the drugs, the unequal pay, the uh, abuses and diseases and so on and so forth which is also uh, a government's responsibility to provide safety for its people, even if the people are con conducting a very unpopular uh, job or service and so on and so forth, right? Okay, nextly, after we talk about this is true, we need to talk about why it is very important. Why is important? Okay, we need to analyze why it is very important for us, for the state, to protect the market. It is why it is very important for us to provide protection and safer environment for the consumer and service provider, okay? The reason why this is important is three things. Firstly, we can analyze that the provider are mostly women, which most of them are a victim of structural poverty, and also most of it are government failure to alleviate them. Most of them, huh, are of disenfranchised women that are forced into work because there are no alternatives to survive. In so far, the government can even provide them the help they need. So what we just did is we say this is very important because they are a victim of poverty and the poverty itself is a part of government failure to deal with the poverty. And then secondly, the government can even feed them, right? The government cannot give them health in the status quo. Uh, so it is not the government's right to uh, to criminalize a thing that might help the citizens survive, right? So let me just say that even the government cannot help them. So at least the way we can help them is let them do their job, for example. Uh, and only if they choose to, to do this job, right? 
but B, the reason why this analysis is important and we need to protect them is the criminalization put these workers under the demonization spotlight that they are worthless human being that does not deserve any protection by the state or the society, meaning whatever happened to them, it is their fate. Basically, what we just did is that the legalization is very important to protect them because those workers are deemed not human. And the moment that they need protection, they report abuses, they report unequal pay, they report drug uh, forcefully using drug on them, the state and the society are completely silent and instead blame them. Oh, it is your fate that you do that job. That is your consequences. Whatever harm happens to you, you should see it a kilometer or a mile away and so on and so forth. Right? It is very inhuman. Therefore, we need to protect them uh, to uplift discriminalization and so on and so forth. But see, the reason why we need to legalize this and to protect the, the, the market, for example, the provider and consumer, is that because the intercourse often harms both provider and consumer and often put themselves in harm's way, inflicting more harm. You can also add on analysis, for example, as a state, we, a state must be adaptive to the dynamicity of the society, that the society is constantly changing and the society have multiple needs that needs fulfilling as soon as possible. Therefore, the state needs to prevent harm and protect the society from harm's way by regulating, by doing protocols and so on and so forth. Because yeah, the society, no matter what your status, is a subject of the state. Okay, so that is the three reason why the analysis on legalizing this is very important because we need to give protection and we need to uh, acknowledge that this is also a government's inability to help them. Therefore, we need to let them help themselves. And thirdly, we need to protect them from harm. Okay, after we talk about why it is true and important, again, we, we are going to move on into the impact. Uh, next. Okay, so we need to analyze if we legalize the if we legalize this, the impact is protection. So we need to characterize and analyze again that legalization will mean protection that either the provider and consumer, if violation happens, they may go to the local police station and report, not in status quo, where if they are reported, they will be imprisoned and investigated. Instead. What we uh, what we want is that they they are going to be consoled and listen. Whatever their problem are going to be deal humanely like a regular citizen that they did not have to be fear. Uh, I'm sorry, they did not have to be afraid that if they are going to open up, come up or speak up, they are going to be uh, persecuted by the government and so on and so forth. Instead, they can come and ask for protection. Right? This is ideally what we want when we talk about protection and legalization. But secondly, we can we can also aim. Of course, we need to uh, explain likelihood after this. For example, abuse, deduct, and unequal pay, and rape will be taken care of. May workers, women, and disenfranchised women that are stuck in structural poverty may fight for their life, and so on and so forth. And the state, even if they can directly help them, at least we can provide them some sense of security and help them do their job. Okay, of course you need to uh, also uh, analyze on how can we uh, how can we eradicate abuses and drugs and so on and so forth. For example, by yeah safety protocols, work and so on and so forth, uh, by uh, providing hotline uh, and services uh, and impose, for example, uh, whatever or whoever they are working for to ensure. Uh, and guarantee the well-being of the workers and so on and so forth, which can be done if it's legal. So basically what we just did is that we analyzed after legalization what will come. The, analy the analysis is that what will come is protection for both not only provider, but also consumer, right? Because for example, if there are violations that suddenly the consumer have STD, for example, yeah, they might be able to sue the provider or if the provider got STD and they 
uh, uh, ignore the protocol and so on so forth, the provider may sue the consumer and the and ask for justice and so on and so forth. So what we just say is that they can do their job and enter the market with protection. So if, even if something happens, it's going to be good, right? So not only we say that this is going to protect them, we also on the truthfulness level, we also analyze why this is important and they are worthy of protection. But thirdly, after that, how can we change their life and change the market and facilitate their uh, their methods that they choose to survive and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, nextly, rebuttal. Uh, firstly, uh, and a disclaimer, you should treat a rebuttal like an argument, right? Uh, so if you are, if in an argument you are going to have assertion, you are going to have reasoning, an example, and link back. You are going to have why it is true, why it is important, and the impact, and so on and so forth. You also need to apply the same step that we just did into rebuttal and put on effort to that particular rebuttal. Okay. So basically, the, mo the most problem that I face on a fresh from the oven debater is that they just make rebuttal because they need one. And then the rebuttal is just one liner. Oh, what the government say is wrong because of they are just simply problematic that the society is rational enough and so on and so forth. And, they, and it is that they stop on the analysis that, oh, the society is rational enough. But... More often than not, judges cannot buy that because it is very one-lining and it poses no claim or anything whatsoever, right? So making it as just because you need one, more often than that, it's not effective. So instead, uh, in the most simple manner of rebuttal, there are something we can do. Uh, next. Uh, there are three things that we can do in a rebuttal. The first thing is that we can fight claim A with A minus, which completely disprove and say that A is wrong, A is not important, A is incorrect, and A impact is just bad, and so on and so forth. After we fight A with A minus, we can talk about even if. We can, uh, <clears throat> we can assume that even if our rebuttal, our A minus does not work, and even if the A that our opponent posit still stands, uh, we can assume that even if that happened, it's going to be bad anyway, and the harm that they are proposing is not that significant. And thirdly, what we should do is we should conclude why our rebuttal is enough to mitigate the harm or benefit that they are presenting. Okay, let's look at an example. Uh, next. Uh, let's say that the motion is this house opposed social journalism. Social journalists, uh, for your information, social journalism is where an amateur journalist and a prof professional journalist might share the same platform and they can uh, coexistly post articles into that platform, right? For example, like uh, Compass or uh, Forbes and that. Uh, I don't know the example, like compass and so on and so forth. Let's say that the government claim is that oh, the social journalism, the social journalism will lead into many misinformation and misunderstanding in society. Okay, so I think uh, the most effective and the most obvious A minus we can make, we can make is that firstly we say the A minus is it is less likely because in order to be accepted as an author in a platform. Because although the amateur writer may join, but it is not an, an, an experienced one, right? It is not just some fresh from the oven journalist that have no credibility came, for example, and then join the platform. Because oftenly, we can analyze in our rebuttal that the platform will assess the author's capability, past writings, and other background check by fact checker, and etc. So to share a platform with professionals, Authors with tendencies of misinformation with hoax and stuff and so on will not be accepted to begin with. Okay, 
So what we just did in this A minus rebuttal is that we say to join, uh, to have a joint platform with professionals, you are going to be checked and then whatever uh, signs that you are giving that are you a clickbait person? Do, do you uh, full caps lock on your articles? Uh, heading with many exclamation point and then misinformation you are not going to be accepted. So there is less likely for social journalism to be misinforming. So this is how we fight the A of this claim, right? But nextly, uh, next. Uh, okay, and then we are going to assume that even if they do have misinformation, even if there are going to be some hoaxes or misinformation, there are two things that are that still exist in status quo that will tackle and handle this, this misinformation. Okay, firstly, there are fact checker and rational part of the society that exists that are also going to create text and these persons exist on a spectrum. So even if it happened, there are a very big chance that it is going to be exposed since it will it will collide to the actual truth anyway because any contradiction will be you know checked upon by the fact checker the society and the critics and they simply just comment and talk about oh this is wrong and so on and so forth right so this, the society will be able to spot the actual truth anyway but b the society and the writer and critics can report the post to be taken down censored or demand accountability clarification and so on and so forth and etc to straighten the misunderstanding so what we just did is is that even if the platform are going to uh, let somebody that are completely amateur that that have tendencies to spread hoaxes and misinformation and to join the platform we still have other things that exist in status quo that might mitigate this harm to begin with so the social journalism is okay then there are no it posits no problem that we cannot handle right <clears throat> so what we just did is that we are we are not dismissing the problem from the government team. We did not say that, oh, you are halu, you are hallucinating, that harm is non-existent. But what instead what we just did is that we minimize the impact that they serve. We minimize the, uh, the concretization of their case. We say that it is not that harmful, it is actually very small, and we can mitigate them or whatsoever, right? And then nextly, we can conclude that whatever and whoever write the article, there will always be opposing side that they are willing to check upon the truthfulness of the information, meaning that the society will have the both side of the coin anyway, and at best, this will only spark discussion. And after this week, you can also analyze why discussion is good. You can uh, make it in integrated into your case, for example, in your argument that, oh, this is very good. So we can spark discussion in society to talk about many subjects, politics, and so on and so forth. We can look upon their true ideology and stuff and so on. We're just going to create uh, information exchanges in the comments section and so forth. So it's very good, for example, right? Also, another claim you can make is that you can claim that on the opposition side, for example, you can claim that uh, you're going to let someone that is uh, that have a very unique perspective to come upon journalism, even if they're not journalists and so on and so forth right so what we just did is uh, we accept the harm and we did not stop on one primary line uh, one lining analysis and we provide the adjudicator for example with other reasons to not buy the chair that the government teams are proposing right so this is a very important thing uh, for you guys for you guys as a fresh debater to not stop an analysis. I think the easiest way to do this and to not stop on one analysis, constantly ask yourself why, right? To so constantly ask the truthfulness pillar of your opponent, uh, why is that true? Uh, why is that important? And then keep asking why after you create an analysis, right? And at some point when you have no why left, and then you can present your rebuttal to begin with. Okay, uh, next.
Uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh, <clears throat> I think one more thing that I want to talk about that are not in the PowerPoint is that actor analysis. Uh, like the previous, uh, like this. Uh, can you guys, uh, the previous slide, please? Okay. Uh, one thing, one last thing. Uh, in every motion, whatever motion it is, uh, okay, it's good. In every motion exists, is there are going to be some actors, right? For example, in this this house oppo social journalism, there are always be some subject that are going to interact between or below this motion, right? So under this house oppo social journalism, of course, the actor is going to be society. The actor is society, journalist, and then fact checker, and so on and so forth, right? So the easiest way to know who we should protect is that we need to analyze the tendencies of each actors, right? For example, not all journalists is righteous. Not only of not every one of them is perfect and can compose a very perfect article that are very insightful and so on and so forth. We need to also have uh, the ability to spot that some of these journalists is just mm, might not serve our best interest at some point. But we can also analyze the society, right? Not all of the society is hoax pro. Some of them are very conservative, unable to filter the information that they receive. Some of them are teenagers, for example. Some of them are young adults. Some of them are fanatics. Some of them are religiously radical, and so on and so forth. You can also split upon society into many groups, and then you can analyze why social journalism are going to be very harmful for those particular groups that live in society. Why we are going to set off a conflict between the religious community if the journalism will talk about uh, something that is very contradictory. For example, uh, uh, some society uh, prohibit a Christian, for example, to build churches, but they did not write in the article that the land that they are going to build a church on is illegitimate, that the ownership of that land is not clear. Therefore, that is exactly why they are prohibited to build a church on that land. And this, there are a lot of information like this that are cherry-picked by the journalists especially amateur journalists that use those exclamation point, exclamation point and click base and so on and so, on, so forth that more often than not triggers conflict in society and so on and so forth. So the way and the easiest way to spot a claim and spot a burden in the debate is that you can analyze the actor, their tendencies, and then you can also split their behavior on how trustworthy are they, how good are they, and can you split them into a very and into another group of people, for example? And what is their best interest? And how is this interest collide into each other's that whether or not it's going to create conflict or peace at the end of the day? Okay, uh, that's it from me. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. And thank you, and have a good day, everyone. Okay, thank you so much for our brother Jeremy Joy. For the more uh, for the most informative uh, material that we know that we have uh, how to spark the discussion about our debate and how to make our our motion more stronger. Okay, as the same as the last our uh, our first speaker, I'm open three chance for people to asking to bro Jeremy Joy. So if you wanna ask, please raise your hand and then open the camera and raise your side. Please, if you uh, have a question, please raise your hand. Okay. okay, I already see two people raise their hand. Raise their hand. Okay, I'm gonna choose the process for Stephanie Ross to uh, give the question to Bangdi Pinjoy. Okay, hello. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, firstly, I'd like to apologize because I can't open my camera due to connection problems. 
But my main question is that I've heard that in debates, sometimes when you're uh, arguing your motions and settling your arguments, there are uh, times where the arguments end up going in the same direction, where they agree on one thing, but they're so against it. How would you uh, solve that type of stalemate in, in a sense? Because you're arguing about two, uh, the same topic, in different areas but you end up going in the same way and how would you argue uh with that to to your uh to your advantage yeah how would you do that thank you so much uh okay uh, thank you for the question uh before i answer do you have any simple example of the circumstances because i feel that if there are some agreement in the debate i think it is called room of agreement that at some point it is necessary uh, at some point room agreement is necessary that for uh, sides and peace in the in the debate to uh, understand that there are something that is particularly true but do you have an example upon that heavy contradiction that you talking about I think uh, if this counts, I think I had one when I was in a minor competition in my school. Uh, the topic was on how uh, it was a disease that affected kids, and I was the opposition, if I was correct. Uh, we disagreed that like it only affected kids. We uh, uh, we we told them that like actually adults could be more susceptible to that because of the working hours and like their lower. Uh, their working hours that result in lower uh, health, right? And then the other team kept on debating that, yeah, but uh, they're adults, but they're adults. And it ended up with them keeping, uh, keep on pressing on the fact that like adults work longer hours. And we agreed that yes, adults work longer hours, but that would result them in being more susceptible to tiredness and lower, uh, yeah, and like, but in the end, the judges ended up agreeing to the uh, proposition's answer, even though we've clearly stated that like, yes, adults work longer hours, but that would result in lower uh, and like, I was really confused on like, how did that not work? Because it was, we were accepting the fact that yes, uh, they work longer hours, but they ended up easily sick more. So, like, any opinions on that? Uh, does the motion particularly and specifically say that this disease is for children? It did, yes. It was it uh, way, uh, it said that it was more susceptible to children. Maybe, uh, gampang kena ke anak gitu. Okay. And then, uh, I think uh, it is very, firstly, uh, I think if the debate is broader than that, that the disease is, is not only a subject to children. I think you did a great job. But I think the problem is it is very dangerous to deviate from the motion like that, right? If the motion uh, uh, specifically and explicitly says that this disease is only subject and proning to children, it is very unstrategic to us to deviate and say that, oh, adults can get into it, right? Uh, this is the reason is very simple because this is not the spirit of the motion itself, right? So, in this case, I think it is our problematic error on our side. But I think in another motion, I think you did a great job on breaking that uh, thing. Uh, it is actually a good analysis on spotting that adults do have longer work longer hours, therefore they are going to have a lower immune sustainability and and so and so on and so forth. But I think in my personal view is that it is our error to deviate from the motion that explicitly says that, oh, this is a subject to children, which makes them prone to the disease itself. Gitu. Oh, okay. I see. Thank you very much for the answer. It was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since it is a very explicit uh, spirit of the motion, it is quite hard for us to deviate from the motion and ensure the judges that you should uh, you should use our definition in opposition more and then you should uh, disregard that part of the motion that it is for the children unless 
unless you have a specific information that you possess that might be true and the motion is wrong, which is very rarely happen. This mostly never happen, but unless you do have a very factual information that you have, and then uh, the society, the, the, the debate, or the, the debate chamber agrees with you, I think you can pull that off, but this is a very rare circumstances that almost never happen. So yeah, like that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you for the question, Stephanie. Now, uh, there's another question. Uh, okay, GCO again. So please turn your camera if you can and, and uh, ask your question. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I can't turn on my camera. Yes. Uh, I just, I just want to ask, like, if you don't mind, can you explain simply on the point rebuttal claim A with A minus? Because I don't really get the point at all. Thank you, Kak. No, okay, uh, here's the thing. Okay, so... Okay, let's say that A is a claim. Let's say the claim heading is social journalism will lead into many misinformation, right? So A minus is basically saying that social journalism will not lead into misinformation. So that is A minus is basically basically turn the A upside down and use it into your advantage. So if the A says that it will lead into misinformation, A minus will say that it is not going to be misinformation because there are so many reasons. Because there are selection, there are a background check, there are fact checker, there are discussions, there are critics, there are rational part of the society that are going to fight this misinformation. Therefore, social journalism, A minus, will not lead into misinformation. That is the most basic. Uh, explanation on that so basically we are turning the claim upside down they say that it is just false it is just not important oh thank you uh, i hope that that helped uh do you have any further or follow-up questions uh Jeko? Okay, I guess this is the question for people. Okay, well, we move to the last question from Muhammad Hanafi. Okay, so thanks. Yeah, hello, can you hear my voice? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, my questions uh, from the first motion that said this house would ban Zeus, in the point of impact, that the third point. They said we can redirect this to the Taman Safari, which operate in a better way where animals roam free and human visits in the cage. Because the entertainment and the animals remain happy. Is that still in the right way with the motion? Because we should ban the zoos. And we said about Safari Park, it's still relevant with the motions because I'm still do not understanding in the last point. Thank you. Okay, I, okay, good job, yeah. I personally think it is still relevant because if the government government says that, I think uh, the concern that might happen from the opposition, there are a lot of concern. But what we just did is that we say the existence of interaction with animals, the interaction with mother nature, that children can see still elephants and giraffes and tigers in real person, eye to eye, even if there are no zoos, we still have other things. So what we say is that even if we ban zoos and then zoos is completely gone, wiped out from the surface of earth, uh, children and society will go to somewhere and look on animals and stay and still happy. So what we just say is that not only banning zoos will protect animals and send a message to the society, but banning zoos gave us no harm because we can still access the same thing that zoos offer 
which is a direct interaction with animals in other form of uh, zoos, which is Taman Safari. So even if we ban them, we have nothing to lose. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for all the question, and thank you for the answer too, uh, Bang Jerry Joy. Uh, it's really, mm -hmm. really uh, I want to say thank you and appreciate too for all our speakers today, from Kadisika and Bang Jerry Joy, for all the knowledge and the experience that uh, they have been shared to us. It's really meaningful. Thank you. And uh, now. We will have a game section that three lucky person will uh, prize. Uh, for that, I would like to invite my, my friend, Mikolo Kentaro, to join me in this game section. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fahari, for giving me chance. Uh, hello, guys. My name is Mikel, and I will lead you, to, I will lead you guys through this game session. And so this game session will be in the form of quizzes. Uh, let me share screen my mind first. Uh, okay. Did you guys see my screen? Okay, did you guys can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So this game here will be in the form of Quizzes. I will send the link, and you guys can join with this with the code with your game code. Okay. I want to remind you before joining the link, please use your real name because if you use fake name, you will get disqualified from this game. Yes. Please um enter please your name and your real, real name. name. Yeah. Okay, Fari. I see so much excitement yeah, from the participants. I think they are so excited to join this event, to join this game. Because there is a door prize for the three lucky person who, who have the highest score. Yeah, there will be a three lucky person who will get this prize. Yeah, this prize okay. It's really, really... Yes. Okay, okay, I will wait until the participant join the game. Okay, you guys can join the quizzes with this code. I remind you again, please use your please yeah. use your and real name. Please use your real name because uh, if you got if you want to claim your gift, uh, you need to use your real name. Okay, okay. Before I start the game station, I want to see your guys' um, excitement. Can you guys give the reaction to the Zoom room chat? If you guys excited for this game session, okay, okay, have you guys joined? Okay, there is 15 person, 15 people here. Okay, I will wait until um, a lot of participants join this game. Come on, guys. Okay. Okay, there is 17 person. I will wait again. 18. Okay, okay. Okay, before I start the game, can you guys give the reaction? Your guys' best reaction in this game session? Okay, Sylvia. Wow, Sylvia, so, so excited, yeah. Stephanie, Messi, Ria. Okay, okay, Alvin. Okay, I think they are so excited. Come on, guys, join. Mm, yes. I think after the material session, they, they are so excited yeah, for me, yeah, to join this game session. Yeah, and I said, uh, 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 I hope you guys lucky because you already listened to, to our main speaker today. I hope you can answer all these questions. Yes, if you guys listen carefully to the material session, I think you guys can be the winner in this game session. <laughs> Okay, I will wait again. Okay, let's join, you guys. Is it crossing is hard or like what? Or is it easy? Uh, let's see then. Let's see then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it will be so funny. Okay, okay. Give your reaction, guys. Give your reaction. 
first your reaction guys okay we are give a reaction okay we got from Alvin Rafda oh, okay i guess that's Rafda again Isabel okay uh, so oh my god there's so many reaction okay i think that's enough i think should we start our our game session okay. I guess. Uh, oh, wait, wait. I guess it is. Okay. Eleven fifteen, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Okay. 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 Come on, guys. Ah. Uh. Come on, come on. Okay, there is twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Okay, the participant will add up more and more. Pandu Febriana. Okay, they are so excited. Okay. I'm curious who is the three lucky person who, who gonna get the door prize? Yes, I'm so curious who's gonna get the door prize. Okay, there is 29 people. Okay, 30 people. I hope. I hope all of you guys can join this quizzes because there is a door prize for the winner. And you guys will regret it if you guys cannot join this game session. You will regret it. Yeah. The door prize is so, so interesting. <laughs> okay, 30. Okay. Okay. I will wait one minute more. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. I think it's it's enough. We should start our organization. session. Um. Okay. Should we start our game session, Fahri? A little bit. Okay. 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 I think it's enough. We should start our game session, and I will start the games in three, two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we until that eleven fifty-five because I still the uh, I see the number is still keep it going from. Okay, we will we will again. Yeah, we will. Come on, guys, join the game. Come on, join the game. It's not a counter if you right or wrong. Uh, yeah. Better. You'll be regretted. Yes, you'll be regretted. <laughs> After you guys been through Maybe all day. Guys the winner or oh, it's already 35 people. Right. Please faster join the game. Join the link. Yeah. Okay, we I will wait until 55. After all day long, you guys been through, you're gonna regret it if you guys didn't join this game station. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. There's 36. Oh, uh, maybe we can, we're waiting until 40%. Uh, 40 people, yeah? Okay, 40 people. Okay, I will wait. Okay, let's join Kokomi. Okay, Kokomi is so excited. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will wait until... Come on, 40. 40 person join, 40 people join. I'm curious, I'm curious who's gonna win. Okay. Wow, there's a lot of people here. There is Nana, Christabel, Umar, Sabrina, Febriana. And the prize is, it's really, really useful prize. And yeah, I yeah. Especially, especially if you guys are a student, that will be so useful for you guys. Okay, let's join, guys. Let's join. Don't forget to use our real name, okay, guys? Or you will get this. Okay, 37, uh, three person more. Three person more. Come on, faster, guys. Okay, faster, faster, faster. Two. Okay, two more. Two person okay, more. Two. I give it luck to Wickel, where's your luck? Here. Yeah, it's mine. 
Okay. Okay. Once again, before I start the the game session, can you guys give this reaction? Give this reaction, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Two person more. I will wait until fifty-five. Come on, guys. Two person more. Oh. Okay. Wait. Okay. Oh. Okay. Wait. Just a little bit. Okay, wait. There is um, some technical problems. Technical problem here. No. Okay. You guys still in the room? Okay, they're still in the room. Okay, we wait for uh, two percent more. Mm -mm. And then we close it and we're going to play the game. Okay. Please do your best in this game and don't forget. The price mm -hmm. is waiting for you. Use your real name. Okay, okay. Thank you for the reaction, Rafda. Thank you, Rafda. I, I can see your your excitement in this in this game session. Okay, Stephanie, Messi, Mutiara, Alvin. Thank you, guys, for the reaction. Okay, I think it's enough, Fahri. Yeah, I think it's enough. There's no more question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna start it. Uh, okay. Can I come down with Can I do the content? Wait, oh. I will uh, maximize the screen first. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Okay, I'm so excited. okay. Oh. wow. 39. Okay, I think we should start right oh. now. Okay, Fadi, should we start? Okay. Okay, we will start oh. in three, two, three, two one. one. Start. Okay. Good luck, guys. Okay, good luck, everyone. Okay, we will see who's gonna get the first place. Okay, Christabel. Christabel oh at the first place. Ria Aini Fami in the second. Muhammad Umar in the third place. Stephanie in the five. Okay, okay, guys. Okay. Okay, oh, Mr. Yeah. still in the first place. Wow, Ria, Ria got the first place. Okay, Ria moved to the first place. Okay, wow, Ria got the first place again. Okay, the second yeah. is Crystal Bell. Oh, Michelle. Michelle is second place. Muhammad mm -hmm. Umar, wow. Come on, guys. Come on. Ria still in the first place. Wow, Ria. Okay, Alvin. Michelle. Oh, my God. Come on, guys. Come on, come on, come on. Michelle still in the first place, I see. Okay, Michelle still in the first place. Wow, Michelle. Oh my god, Michelle still in the first place. And the following is Aldin. Oh, Aldin got the first place. Michelle again. Oh. Sangat sengit ya, Michelle. Yeah. I think that's competitive. That's yes, like competitive. it's very competitive. <laughs> uh, uh, now if Aldin hold the first place, and then Ria is on the floor. Aldin still in the first place. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Oh, my God. This yeah, Michelle. Okay. Hands position. This is proof that you guys... Michelle at the first place. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Michelle, wow. Sylvia, wow. For the first time, got the first place. Oh, wow, Sylvia from the bottom to the top right now. <laughs> okay, that's quite competitive. I'm curious who is the winner. The, the, the three Who's going to win? The, the mysterious prize. Yeah. Okay, come on, come on. <laughs> Oh my god, still Fia still in the first place, I think. Still Fia. 
Okay. I think that's obvious, yeah, Maria. I think that's obvious. Yeah. With the winner. I can see who's the winner now. Yeah, we got the winner now. Come on, guys. I will wait until give up a the other finish that. their quiz. We can all just give a proof that all of this person were listening to our speaker today. And I'm so... Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, my God. Uh, this is a proof that all of these participants were listening clearly to our speaker today. Okay, we will wait. Okay, there is 24 person that has done the quiz. Where's the others? Okay. Okay, I think time's time is out. Okay, we will with the others. Okay. Hurry up, guys, hurry up, hurry up. Um I will wait until all the participants has done their quiz. Okay, 13 people more. Come on, guys. Okay. Oh, there is fans, Brad Joy. Wow, who is the fans, Brad Joy? Okay, Kak Joy, I think, I think you got the fans here. Fans, Brad Joy. <laughs> Okay. okay, I will show you guys the, the top five. Okay, where is the others? I will wait until the participant has done their quiz. Hurry up, guys. Okay, I think... Okay, I think that's enough. We got the winner. Okay, I think that's enough. I will end this game session in three, two, and one. Who is the winner? Hello? Okay. Winner. Who's the winner? Ding, da, 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 da. Okay. 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 Wow. Okay, wait. I'm disconnected. Okay, we see the winner here. Okay. Wait, I'm disconnected. I think we got a winner here. Oh, yeah. Um, don't forget the screenshot for your absence, okay? Before yes, you please. If you guys uh, win this game session, don't forget to screenshot the proof. And if you guys want to claim the if you guys want to the price, you guys can show the code. Okay. 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 Oh wait. Okay. So the winner here is uh, Michelle in the first place. Um, the second place is Sylvia. Okay, wait, there is this connector. Wait, wait, wait. Hey guys. 
Okay. 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 Okay, I think I got the winner. The first place is Sylvia. The second is Michelle. And the third is Aldin. Um, don't forget to screenshot your proof, the result of the quizzes. And if you guys want to claim the, the prize, you guys can show the proof to the committee. Okay. How to, how to show this, the winner? Okay, the first place is Sylvia, the second is Michelle, and the third is Aldin Nasrud. Okay, okay, this is our winner today. The first place is Sylvia, Sylvira, the second place is Michelle, and the third place is Aldin. Congratulations for all Congratulations the, the winner of this presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, that's all from me. And I want to remind you guys again, if you guys want to claim the prize, you guys can screenshot the proof and then show it to the committee to claim your prize. Uh, I think that's all from me uh, as the leader of this conversation. Uh, I would like to say goodbye and thank you very much. I will give back to the moderator. Okay, congratulations for all the winners. Good applause for them. Uh, okay. For those who are now, the committee will be contacting you through WhatsApp. So yeah. that is all our and then of our from any event, TNA, yeah. I guess uh, we will do a uh, our documentation for certificate for our speakers. So it's, it's still Kajika to here. Okay, I guess uh Kajika is still not in here again. Uh Bang Jeremy Joy is still here. Yeah, yes I am. Yeah, okay. Uh please turn on the camera because we will uh, I'll do the documentation for a certificate. Okay, uh, in one, two. Three.
Oke, okay, now we do uh, the first section. Uh, Bang Jeremy join. Wait, we're gonna take a screenshot. From three, two, one. Okay, once again. Three, two, one. Okay, one once again. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you for Bang Jeremy join. Thank you for having me, Kamati, and everyone. Okay. Is Kak Jessica? Oke, okay, uh, for the last session, uh, please for the participant turn on the camera because we will have a documentation section. So please turn on the camera. For those, the camera is at work. Okay. But if you can turn on camera, please turn on. Our countdown from three to one. Again, again, three to one. Again, the, the last three to one. Uh, 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 for the last session, uh, can I ask you to do this? Like this is the effect sign. Can you can you guys do this? Like this, like through. okay. Okay. In three, two, one. Yeah, in three, two, one. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Okay, now uh, maybe that's the end of our agenda now. And I, as your moderator, as the Huwe, and this event will be handed back to our master of ceremony. So I'm Muhammad Fakri, and see you. Okay, thank you to our moderator Fahri for leading the webinar and thank you for our amazing speakers and everyone who attends our event today. And I would like to say thank you to the, all the committee participants and everyone involved in this year and UDC webinar. And with that, we officially wrap up our event today and see you at the next UDC webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, you can. Uh, you, you can. Uh, no, you can leave the Zoom room. Uh, don't forget to fill the absent, guys. Please fill the absent before you left the Zoom meeting. The link is already on the room chat. Uh, so, so please fill the link. Fill the absent.
Recording stopped.